three, two, one. Pepsi spicy like a hot lady. Pepsi spicy like a cr- triple grand duke. The people say me crazy because they don't even know me. I live in a little town near my house, a little restaurant. It's called Saku Noodle. I usually go there, buy a Pepsi. I only drink a little bit Pepsi. I can feel it. Plus, no matter where I go, I feel the like <laughs> the same. So I will <laughs> sing it over, over, over again because Pepsi spicy like a hot lady. Pepsi spicy like a triple grand do, 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 do. And there's more to the song, but I'm going to leave it there. Nice. That was from... I actually had an opening. Oh, yeah? just, look out, it's got Jiro. Oh, okay. Mine mine was oh, spicy because there's spice in the film. Yeah, I'm glad we had two. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Uh, I okay, thought they were both see, good. That was uh, both from good. Yeah. Uh, rapper Jeff Liu, not to be confused with the Jeff Liu who directed Killer Bean. Okay, cool. <laughs> so this is Sardonicast, and my name's Adam from Your Movie Sucks. Oh, I'm Ralph huh? the Movie Maker from YouTube. <laughs> I'm sorry, Ralph the Movie Maker. I'm Alex Maichi, and I, I was hoping you were going to start with the kind of throat-talking uh, voices from Dune, you know? Do you remember how the, like, the movie begins before... You the, do it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I can't do it. It's like a, it's so, such a deep, guttural, like, seeing it in IMAX, it, like, bursts Is your it like one of those, like, um, like, Mongolian all, like, throat singer <laughs> things? <laughs> I don't remember. You know, and it's got the bass, and it's like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we'll get into it. <laughs> What'd you think of a Dooney movie? I, I, I had such a, an interesting time with it. I mean, I, I've seen it two, two and a half times now. Okay. Um, the first time, yeah, I saw it in IMAX. And I, I got to say, at the end of it, I was a bit torn. Because at the time, th- there was no confirmation of a part two. So what we had was this kind of half a story in a vacuum with no promise that it's ever going to continue. Um, and it, and it does feel like a lot of build up. It feels like half a book. So I was kind of like, okay, I'm down with this. I like what it's building to, but I feel inherently unsatisfied by, uh, just not knowing what's coming or yeah. the fact that it might never come. Um, obviously that's changed now. I mean, and seeing it again, I've got different thoughts, but I just found that a, a really weird first impression to a movie because I can't think of another time where just half a book has been adapted with plans this kind of vague. Yeah, uh, it was a maybe. Or not, not in stone. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like a maybe. It was we might make like, it Yeah, if, it's got, if it gets a good response. But it's like it, the film otherwise does not work. Yeah. It, it needs the part two. If it it's, makes it's money during COVID, you know. Yeah, so I found that <laughs> frustrating aside from the actual storytelling and just as a... Just a confusing choice, um, an, an understandable one, I suppose, considering Blade Runner twenty forty nine and it not being the biggest financial success, and just Dune's infamous history in cinema of being known as basically being unadaptable. Yeah, but especially upon and actually on that first watch too, I was getting hung up on because I'm not familiar with the Dune story. I'm not. I haven't read the book yet. I've picked mm-hmm. it up now because I'm quite into what it's building to now, but. I was getting lost because there were no subtitles on the IMAX screening. It's like, what, what are they saying? Like, what, what are oh, these God. big sci-fi words you're talking about? Especially with how some of the actors and the way, <laughs> the, like, like the Baron, for example, like his, the way he delivers some of his lines is so kind of gruff and mumbly, and I like that choice. But I was, I was getting lost in some of the dialogue in terms of what he was actually saying, and I was finding that a bit frustrating. But, but so the subtitles yeah. were too big on your IMAX. Because you were so close? No, I'm saying there weren't subtitles, there weren't. so like, I was struggling uh, to understand like what any some of these... Yeah, because there's yeah. parts that are like... In the screening I saw, there were parts that have subtitles, like in the alien yeah, language parts. or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those parts. But I feel like those parts are vital. Like, you need that shit. Mm-hmm. I watched it yeah. at home to piss off Dennis Villanueva. Um, but I have a good <laughs> system. What's really funny is, on my HBO Max... The subtitles just wouldn't turn on, <laughs> I, and it was like, oh. sorry, so you kind of had the same through. experience. Yeah, I had the same experience of just like, damn, I wish there were subtitles here. And it said that they were turned on on my HBO Max thing, but they weren't, and so that was a little frustrating. Maybe I should have restarted the app. I have no idea. Um, <laughs> speaking of sci-fi words, though, there's I I don't I didn't write every one of these down, but there were quite a few words in this universe that just sound like other words. And it was kind of weird, like yeah. Caledon. It just sounds like Canada. And I'm like, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's like a bunch of them. It was really weird. Bene Gesserit is a confusing one. If you've never seen it written, <laughs> yeah, then Bene you Gesserit. really have no idea like, <laughs> what to pinpoint. <laughs> yeah. 
it did feel like a very grand world with all the language and the part one it starts with part one yeah. It feels like there's more coming, that there is more to this world than just one movie, and that makes it feel a bit more epic. And that's something I like about it. It definitely feels uh, epic, not in like an ironic way. It does way. feel epic. Like a, the true like, way. You can't even fit it all in one movie. It does kind of feel like the start of Lord of the Rings. Except part one functions as its own film. There's like a, and, and there's a journey out, within well, the not first even planning film. out. They were making the other two movies like at the same time, basically, <laughs> as part one. This is a little more up in the air. If Lord of the Rings was never able to make Two Towers and The Return of the King, Lord of the Rings, the first movie, would still be one of the best movies ever. Even if sure. even if the other um, ones I'm glad were there's unable a part to, two to this. But Dune, it kind of depends on you imagining things to come, right? Like that's like yeah, part of the yeah, experience sure. or part of the forgiveness of this film. And I'm not sure I can get behind that. I didn't hate the movie. Like there's a lot of, about it that I think it's well made. <laughs> I don't know if I forgive but it. like yeah, I, I it, even other films that were supposed to be like one single source material and then retroactively split into two, like Kill Bill. Kill Bill Volume One functions as its own film. Still, you know, there's so much more of a journey in that narratively. Mm-hmm. There's so much more satisfaction for, for what you're getting out of the characters and, and the narrative. I did not get that from Dune. Dune, it's like they spend sure. a lot of time probably being very faithful to the book. And, you know, I guess world building, but it also has to be in service of something. And it really didn't. (laughs) If I can't get the basics of like a character that I love that I want to follow, I didn't find any of the characters interesting in Dune. Like, that's a problem. You know, I'm I'm really not (laughs) getting the basics out of what I want of like a storytelling experience. Sure, there are some parts that are like nicely shot and the music works well with some parts. And, you know, it feels epic and grand scale in some parts. But like. What is it in service of? I didn't I didn't I didn't get the the storytelling part. I didn't get the narrative. I didn't get the the whole point that I want to watch like a big epic large scale film, you know? It's interesting you say that cuz I was I was watching some clips on YouTube and everything. There's there's a lot of footage actually of Denis talking about this movie and there's some really good like breakdowns of certain scenes and whatnot on YouTube. I'd recommend watching. But oh, yeah? I found a clip yeah. where he was yeah, yeah. Um, specifically, um, talking about that Bene Gesserit box scene. I'm a big fan mm-hmm. of. There's like a really good video. I've been breaking that down. Um, but uh, yeah, I found a clip of him describing this from it's from his mouth too. He describes the 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 first film or Dune Part One as an appetizer and says with the real meal being Dune Part Two. And this is before it's even <laughs> uh, confirmed. I just think it's it's just unprecedented yeah. to me. This kind of <laughs> <laughs> this approach dune part one is the free bread <laughs> yeah but I, I i guess that's where i disagree with you so i was really engaged in what was happening it just kind of stops and it's like there we go <laughs> it's like yeah it, will, it might even get, be more unsatisfying at the end if you're really engaged because it's like just starting to get interesting you know like oh yeah the first major plot point it kind of just peters off and then like can can we all agree, regardless of what you think of the movie, can we all agree that the last line of the film is fucking bullshit? This is only the beginning. Yeah. Like, that's cancer. I'm sorry. Even if you love the film, you <laughs> yeah, have to admit that, that that's down. absolute fucking sure. cancer. Like, that's yeah, cringe. I don't like that line. It reminded <laughs> like the me of um, <laughs> The Hobbit did that, where it's like, this is just the beginning of the war type stuff, you know? There's another like movie really also, obvious, actually. Like... <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Maybe Zendaya <laughs> yeah. will be in the next one more. Yeah. She's not in this movie a lot. She, she dreams of her. Uh, <laughs> She yeah, smiles a lot at the of camera, like dream but... <laughs> sequences. Yeah, yeah. There were a couple scenes I weren't I weren't too keen on. Like <laughs> I don't know the scene where like um, are we in spoilers? Sure. Can we get into Let's spoilers? Do it. Spoilers. They get like kidnapped and put in a like a flying thing, like a the ship. Ruffle copters. Yeah, yeah. Did right? you call it a ruffle copter? It's Rebecca Ferguson and Timothy Chalamet. <laughs> It's like a it's like a helicopter with like wings or whatever. It's like a flying. It's like, it's like a, a dragonfly. Yeah, but I, I I found this that scene very odd. There was like kind of a comedic tone to it. Like I don't know. <laughs> it was it was a very weird scene. Uh-huh. Just that one in particular. Yeah. Yeah, I I I I agree and understand what you're saying, and I felt the same way on the first watch. But I just feel like it is so dense and it's so accurate to that book it seems and from like the feedback i've read and doom fans seem really happy with how it's come together there is like so much context that you're missing with it almost it almost needs like a forward with like like 
breakdown of like words and factions and what it all means because it is just such a like a such an expansive world a five-part motion comic <laughs> yeah well at least we're not starting on doom part three yeah <laughs> give us a give us a cimmerillion yeah. yeah um i i guess i just i did find those characters interesting and the whole framing of it it's a really interesting science fiction world and that the there are kind of restrictions on the technology so it it also feels ancient and it feels like they have all of these mm -hmm. almost more fantasy type structures where it's kind of, you know, Game of Thrones -y with the houses and the different, you know, political, the, just the inherent political aspect of it. And yeah, yeah, that was fascinating to me. The betrayal and that kind of stuff. Murder. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I feel like so my uh, my roommate, Gael, who uh, came on to talk about Incendie, um, he's mm. a big Lord of the Rings yeah. nerd, like the biggest maybe ever. And, uh, last time I watched the Lord of the Rings for the podcast, I watched it with him and, you know, I'd already seen it so many times, but he had a lot of, uh, he had a lot of commentary and I loved it. There was a lot of interesting stuff I didn't know and just like, um, context, yeah, blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. And it was a very different experience watching it that way. Um, with this nerd commentary over top, I feel like. <laughs> this first Dune movie is something that I would probably enjoy more with that sort of thing. I don't think he's a Dune yeah, nerd, a nerd next so year. I don't know if I'm ever going <laughs> to get that. But if I just had some some dweeb, some dork next to me <laughs> talking about all the stuff that I'm supposed to enjoy about it, I think it probably would have been a better movie for me. <laughs> you know? The Paul Atreides is the blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. We keep bringing codex. up Lord of the Rings and... um. It Dune is kind of known as the the kind of equivalent for the science fiction genre that Lord of the Rings is to fantasy in terms of how like seminal and important and how just crucial to pop culture and science fiction specifically as a genre and how <laughs> yeah it, it's just everything. There's no science fiction story that doesn't kind of go back to it. Mm -hmm. Like uh, <laughs> everyone sure. has been pointing out all the Star Wars comparisons yeah. and the. All this stuff and it's some toxic conversations to come from. I, I was just playing Mass Effect three yesterday, and there was some Thresher mods. Yeah, Mass Effect was on know? my yeah the Thresher mods, mm -hmm. the whole worm thing. Yeah, the sandworm. Yeah, it's it's just that world building. It's so genius from a like an ecology aspect. How the 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 core of the world is basically well, the core of the conflict is is, is a planet Arrakis, a, a, a desert planet where these giant worms produce this drug. Spice melange, um, which Spice is the melange. most valuable resource in the. Yeah, that's that's the Spice full name melange. of it. Spice melange. Because because you were saying yeah, like the you need like a nerd to go in and like explain it. That's that's what I've been doing. I've been like on the Dune wiki, like oh, going cool. in. Um, oh, you want to watch it with me next time? Stuff. You want to be a nerd for me? Oh hell yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll cool. watch it again. I'm, I'm I'm getting more and more into it, and the, and I even. Um, I don't know if it was counting as spoiling it for myself. It didn't feel like spoiling it for myself, but I went back and watched the Lynch version and the documentary of Jodorowsky's Dune and had just a fantastic time. I'm curious about the, the Lynch version, <laughs> but because yeah, I haven't the seen the one. second half of the story, why would I watch that yet? I want to kind of experience that was what everything I was thinking for the first while time. Watching it. Yeah, like why would you watch the second half? Of the movie in the worst version. I really feel like nothing was spoiled for me. Yeah. After watching that Lynch one. Okay. The whole story. Yeah, it, it really genuinely. I really don't think it would okay. like, spoil anything. Yeah. Um I don't know if like Dune fans would disagree with me or whatever, but that that film is so out there and strange and different and such a, mm. a failure, quite frankly. Um <laughs> yeah, it's a funny pretty terrible. one too. And, yeah. yeah. But um I was really enjoying like contrasting it to this new one and just how effective this new one is in comparison just with like uh -huh. kind of basic storytelling stuff like that original uh that eighties one begins with like a it's like a woman's face like floating in space just with this massive exposition dump that just goes on and on. <laughs> and it's it's full of stuff like that and like the shields mm -hmm. and everything are like hilarious in the it's so in that corny. original one. Yeah. Everything but in that it, movie, yeah. Uh, Denny Villeneuve is like better at making this kind of movie, <laughs> for sure. Mm -hmm. the guy made a rival. He has some experience making this kind of film. Yeah, I, I would I would argue Blade Runner twenty forty nine is even a better example because that's also like adaptation of a previous property. Anyway, mm -hmm. speaking of exposition dumps, I, I really enjoy the first like half hour of the movie and how they handled information in particular. Because there, there are moments that kind of are exposition dumps, but they do it in kind of interesting ways. So he's essentially just like reading this like 
what's like a codex and they're talking about the mm-hmm. uh what are they called the iraqis <laughs> like what, what are they called <laughs> or is that a place <laughs> uh, iraqis. Um, iraqis i'm still trying to wrap my head around all the yeah. different factions fremen to... the fremen the free man the right yeah, the, the yeah so he's right. they're like yeah, the explaining man. about the free man the and it, it's Freeman. you know as i'm watching that i'm like oh there's a lot of like cool useful interesting information in here and traditionally, and especially in the science fiction genre, you just get like a block of text at the very beginning, like the year is blah, blah, blah. Here are the political mm-hmm. conflicts. And I appreciate that it didn't do that. So like, even though, yes, what I'm watching at that moment is very clearly, oh, this is an exposition dump moment. It's like still something within the context of the universe where it's like, oh, the character's getting the exposition dump because they're seeking it mm-hmm. out because it's an informational, educational thing that he's doing, right? So... I appreciated that. Yeah, everything feeds into each other. Like it makes Arrakis scarier. Like the just the imagery of the the desert planet. Like it, it's it's very expressive. Everything and just allows for a lot of like fun sequences. But on top of everything, yeah. it's also I just love that the the the, the book was written in the sixties, but this the, the overall metaphor of what it's about is still so prescient, and it's still it hits home really hard for me, and it, it just is such a, a core science fiction story of like just breaking down current humanity and telling a story like reframing it with like the core tenets of the fuck-ups that the human race have traditionally like fallen into like arrakis is basically like the middle east you know and how the west are like four over oil it's like yeah. the same thing but it was written in the Tons 60s and, like, like that yeah yeah i think it's just really clever and can really fit into well, it's just stri- it just it's what good science fiction does. It just strikes at the truth of like yeah, that's definitely what everything's what about. about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure, that's like um, one aspect of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Instead of yeah, oil, like it's that. It's the cool. spice, right? It, which it's the yeah. spice world power basically. Yeah, but the yeah. spice use, isn't just <laughs> yeah. like spice. Baby it's spice. Not like uh, yeah, they use it for scary everything. spice. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, it's magic. <laughs> the way it impacts the world, though, like it, it makes the inhabitants, it makes their eyes turn blue after a while. It's also a hallucinogen, yeah. which kind of plays Mixing into the main blue. character. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm finding it hard to organize my thoughts because this shit is dense. Ramble, is ramble on. I'm love. interested. Well, there's there's a lot going on. Yeah, because the yeah the main character is Paul, who is he's like basically the result of um, eugenics. These Benny Gesserit kind of witch type characters oh, yeah. have been they kind of imply they've been kind of crafting through the generations this this um I've forgotten the term, but basically that it's kind of a prophet type character that the mm-hmm. the one. Yeah. Yeah, the one yeah, type it's like stuff. A prophet. Uh, right. Because he can see he's got abilities basically. There's a this whole the voice um aspect where you can control people mm-hmm. and he has the ability to see the past and present in certain ways that normal people can't and that acts as a lot of like foreshadowing in the movie and it all helps with the build up and it shows a it shows scenes that I assume are gonna happen in in part two now that we're getting that and and all this. And yeah. I found that an a, a a great way to introduce someone into the world through Paul and he's quite an innocent sort of naive but hopeful and uh encouraging character who I, I keep seeing these like discussions about it being like a white savior movie or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. It feels like it's missing the point to me. It feels like he's embracing everything that went wrong before with this whole. Because mm-hmm. his dad tells him, like, we need to instead of just fighting over the resource, we need to get the the sand power, or however he phrases it. Um, and that's kind of what it's about. It's about him, like, actually listening to the 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 native people and embracing yeah. the environment and trying not to and it doesn't end like a new hope it isn't like a victorious ending it's kind of dour ending for this film <laughs> like he kind of lost everything you know like but what did he save at the end he, yeah like, lost it's, i guess that's the thing with like when you contrast it to something like lord of the rings there's like so much uh softness and heart to like lord of the rings whereas denis he kind of he revels more in the the distant kind of cold science fiction. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just feels like his career has kind of been building to this point. And in all these interviews, he's been talking about like when he first picked up Dune, the book, when he was like fourteen, fifteen years old, and he's been trying to like reconnect with that the imagery that was conjured into his mind when he read it as a kid. And he seems really properly invested in the world. And I just think it's yeah, this is how you adapt something of this this import, yeah. you know. Like it's what I want to see. 
uh, on this scale with like a director I want to see with the the cast I want to see is basically every element I want to see and there's it doesn't really fall into the traditional pitfalls I would say which is incredible considering the scope of that novel and just how dense it is and how it's connecting with a wide audience which I was I was scared about I I figured I I was I had faith the film was going to be good but I was concerned about the the wider appeal but wow people are liking it people I mean, are memeing it yeah i thought it was gonna bomb yeah and and blade runner didn't do they well. got they got tim cham they got zendaya they got i think Dave that's what's Batista. Safety, yeah, the they got yeah what's his name from javier Lewin davis they got Har- javier they got uh, Oscar Isaac. Oscar yeah. Isaac, the thank cast you. Is incredible. Right. It, it, it's it's a celebrity. Dump. Oscar Isaac was great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oscar Isaac was probably yeah. my favorite. So I, I don't, oh, I don't find great, it a right. celebrity dump like a dist- in a distracting way. Whereas that's what I mean about the pitfalls a normal movie like this will fall into. I just don't feel that with this movie, like, especially yeah. the casting. I, I got I got distracted. It's I, I'm not like a huge Tim Cham fan, honestly. I like he was great <laughs> and called me by your name. I think he, I think he works well when he's cast as gay twink man. But otherwise, in every other role I've seen him in, like <laughs> he's in a lot of things recently. He's yeah, in French I'm not. Also, it's, it's not, just, not like he's a bad actor a or anything. It's just like he's just like the same. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm him. really uh, bored uh, by him. Uh, who's a uh, the Baron Skarsgård? He was good. Yeah, he's probably one of my favorite characters. Yeah, he's he's one very of my favorite like parts. archetypal uh, villain. Yeah. Like he's like Darth Vader or something. He's just like pure evil. And then but Zendaya, he was good. Like is lots a of good effects with him, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Zendaya is just like one of the the Fremen, right? But she's supposed to be like Hunt down the Fremen. Paul's supposed to find her attractive, I guess. So that's like they got Zendaya. I'm like, okay, it's weird. It's weird <laughs> because sense. it's like you got two people who would be considered what like tween tween love them sort of thing you know, like the heart throbs yeah this is for like young people and then yeah. it's kind of like i don't know the implication is you're making it market. like kind of a less ser- serious movie i don't know i think it in my mind it's just it's a little off it's a little distracting i would have preferred no names but then nobody would have watched it and we wouldn't get part two so whatever yeah that's the thing whereas um i i, I actually like um Timothy Chalamet's performance in the movie. I think he gets some good he's scenes not a bad where actor. he gets to show <laughs> at all. Yeah, I, but what comes to mind in particular is he, he does a really good job in that scene where he's kind of hiding in one of the sand dunes with his mum in that that fun bit of tech that can like protect them um, from yeah, the environment for a great. bit. And because all the the spice is like going into him, he starts having these like visions. And he's having a breakdown and he snaps at his mom and he's like, you did this to me. And that was a really strong scene, I thought, in terms of performance. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I just, I found him a likable main character. I thought he was an appropriate main character because what, what you're describing like, makes me think of like the Eternals, yeah. which has like, <laughs> that's like the cast, you know, it's got like all the Game of Thrones actors, Ange- Angelina Jolie, all these trending actors. And but that wasn't enough because there was no core story there. Like, yeah, even Aquaman is in this and it didn't bother me. I liked yeah. him. Jason Momoa. What's his name? Duncan Idaho? Duncan yeah, that was such Idaho, an odd yeah. character. If there's one thing I didn't like about the movie, maybe some of the trailers were a little too revealing with like the plot. Oh, I didn't watch <laughs> I mean, a single so trailer. It's so clear like what was going to... Okay, that's good. I couldn't avoid them like going to theaters. Oh, you know what I do? I've got a little trick for you. You either go to the bathroom when it starts playing or close your eyes, plug your ears and just hum very lightly to yourself. I've done that. Yeah. Your friends uh, might think you're a little yeah. autistic, but it totally yeah. works. Yeah, I don't know. I've done it. But they were, yeah, they were very like revealing with where his character was going. I'm like, that's a shame because uh, he's good in the movie, I guess. When even with the um, with these huge caliber actors like Charlotte Rampling for the Reverend Mother. You you never see her face. She's covered the whole time, which I think shows like a a commitment to the story and a commitment to his vision and a certain amount of restraint. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Which, yeah, I, I I just appreciated all of all of those kind of decisions, and I, I, it didn't pull me out at all. Even with like Josh, like Thanos and Aquaman being in there, that that didn't bother me. <laughs> Then you do have like your yeah. Javier Bardem's as well, who's who's not in it much, but he's a really memorable character who hammers home the whole the, the core themes of it, of, you know, embracing the environment and, and all mm-hmm. this. Yeah. What did you uh what did you think about the music? Yeah, I was just gonna ask about that. Hans Zimmer. 
Honestly, um, I don't adore the music. Same. Uh, but I, I didn't even know it was Hans Zimmer <laughs> yeah, until after. I was like, what the fuck? Really? Whereas yeah. I felt like it was really quite Hans Zimmer. I, I don't know. I don't have the capacity to sort of fully explain with the words what what, what it was that bugged me about it. Because there are there there are times where it definitely works in it. Mm-hmm. One hundred percent. It carries and it, it, and it, it assists the tone and everything. But there yeah. are also times where I feel like it, it's like overpowering the imagery. It's almost too much. One hundred percent. Yeah, I, I'm glad I'm not alone in that. But. I. I didn't realize it was Hans Zimmer until after, but I, there were parts that I thought were Hans Zimmery. It just sounded like someone else trying to imitate a previous right. <laughs> score from Hans Zimmer. So there's like parts in this where it sounds like the instrumentation is like, oh, that's a little too Blade Runner 2049. It's just not as good. And I'm like, oh, this is like a yeah, well, second rate. It's right? Hans Zimmer. I mean, though. he was working with somebody else when he did that too. But anyway, yeah, I, regardless, if it's the same person, it's not about like, oh, who owns the rights to this s- combination of sounds? It's just, yeah, hey, I don't want to hear something yourself. that I associate with another film already. Whether or not it's just him yeah. recreating his own score, it's like, maybe you should do a different score, you know? Like maybe just if you just started doing the Inception theme again, I would be like, hey, that like, come on, what are you doing? But yeah, there's just a lot about the soundtrack here that just doesn't gel. We had those like a fucking Snyder cut Wonder Woman noises like, ha, ha, ha. like <laughs> I think those are the we're, in, that bothered me. we're in spoiler yeah. territory, but like it's just when that character died, I forget her name, and she like immediately right after she gets stabbed. Ha, ha, Kynes, K Y N E. Yeah, that was a week scene. Yeah, she <laughs> rolls down the fucking hill. Ha, ha, ha. Like, holy shit, that was so inappropriate. That was so bad. Oh my yeah. god, like that was awful. <laughs> that was really cringe. Yeah. <laughs> it was awful. There's yeah. uh, I'm for the most part, I really like the music for this film. Yeah, those those moments. The, uh, yeah, those, those suck. <laughs> those, those parts kind of suck. I thought yeah. Zimmer's like it's stuff like for Blade Down, Runner like 2049 was, was really good, actually. It was amazing. It was great. Yeah, I think actually in all his science fiction movies, the music has, well, in most of his movies, the, mu- mu- the music has stood out. Like a, yeah. like a rival I really associate with some unique sounds. Did he and score things. that? Not Hans Zimmer, sorry, but um, no, I'm getting mixed right. up the guy a little bit. The passed away. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, oh, was that... Did he pass away? The uh... Yeah, I think that was... Um... Fuck, what's ah, his name? That's a shame. A uh, Hansen? Yo, Johansson. Yeah, I don't have his name noted down, but I really enjoy Johan what he Johansson. brings to Denis's movies. Check out yeah. Last and First Men. It's great. Yeah, yeah. He compliments Villeneuve's really well. and Because I, I kept picturing that, like, man, I wish it was kind of leaning more into that, mm-hmm. those kind of sounds and that kind of reserved, I yeah, don't know. Yeah, who knows? Because at the same time, this is trying to be like a big epic, you know, it's... Uh, trying to be kind of i don't know what you want to call it star warsy or something like how, what kind of words do we want to use here like one, one of my biggest problems with the soundtrack and this doesn't happen throughout thank fucking christ but there are a few scenes where they're literally just spamming us with boom boom and it's like mm-hmm. fucking do you not understand like that that sound will be looked at with the same level of seriousness as that like water phone that's in kitchen nightmares you know like <laughs> like that's that's what's gonna happen in like ten years. Like we're spamming the shit out of this boom, and it's just going to be reflective yeah. of the decade. People are gonna use that to parody well, you know films from this the time violin. period, right? Like it's just so it's like annoying. The violin, it how I it's say so about lazy. That. Yeah, it's like exactly copy yeah. and paste. It's the same yeah. shit. It's the uh, yeah. Put in a sound like, effect. It's always mm-hmm. might as well have a laugh track. Yeah, it's kind of the equivalent. It's interesting though, because uh, Hans Zimmer, like he turned down Nolan to work on this. He, right. It's, a, he it's one of his like Nolan. long time passion projects. Like he's wanted to do Dune music. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, it 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 wasn't quite there for me in terms of that stuff. Which yeah, I don't know what the fuck he was so, thinking. He's on the sauce. <laughs> he's a drunk. He could have done the Tenet score, <laughs> which I thought the Tenet score was great. Uh, yeah, yeah. That guy, I liked Lud- the Tenet score. Ludwig, Ludwig Göransson, I think. Um, yes. And then yeah, so for this it was. It was something epic, as Sam Smith would say. There were some epic yeah. things about it. The score is trying to be epic, yeah. It's Warm. not like the entire soundtrack didn't work for me. It was more key was moments great, yeah. that pulled me out of it that I was not expecting to happen. Because I've never experienced that with yeah. any of his previous movies, even. Yeah, for the most part, <laughs> yeah, I like the, the music. Book. I'm just like teasing it. But I, I agree with what you're saying. 
Yeah. I, like I'm, I'm looking at my notes. Like in the first half hour of the f- film, my note was like, "Great soundtrack so far." Like it, a lot of the, my issues <laughs> with the film don't really show up yeah, until like for the most part, past it's good music. the yeah. forty minute mark or something. Like in the first, in the first good chunk of the film, I was like totally into it. I was like so loving it. You know, it was, it, I already mentioned just the way they delivered information, but even ju- even something like that, like over the course of the film, it's like it gets a bit more confusing and it's not as like efficient with what it's doing time wise and information wise. And, you know, all this context into the world building, but we don't really get the result or the end satisfaction of that context, like within this film for the most part. And it's like, damn, like, what am I, what am I left with? Like, I feel like I shouldn't have watched this until just before the second movie. Like, I feel like this was the wrong time to see it. <laughs> like, I should have waited a couple of years. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. Yeah. But I, I do think if the if part two is of the same quality, it will raise this movie up in my mind. You know, if it, if it does yeah. all build up and pay off in a satisfying way. And, and that's not to say there aren't sort of payoffs within this movie. Like, you mentioned that scene earlier, Ralph, with the there's a, there's a deaf character and they have to use the voice. And it's kind of Timothy Paul using the voice like yeah. a, efficiently and saving them um for the first time whereas previously that kind of he's he's pretty bad at it and the you know was yeah, establishing it was a, it was what a the very voice like, is and what it means yeah he was clumsy with the scene i guess that's why i found it awkward cuz then rebecca ferguson like gets on gag and she starts like using the voice mm-hmm. <laughs> and then like one of the pilots starts using the voice they have like a little voice off like a little sing off <laughs> <laughs> It's kind of like ridiculous. I don't know. To go to like back to the music, I guess, because sure. we were talking about that. There's like the scene with where the Bene Gesserit, I guess, leave their planet like toward the beginning. Like I thought that was a good use of music. It was like a mm. very short kind of choir, I guess. Like it's just a yeah. choir. There's definitely but, like really you never good you never really that. hear that again. Like it's used very mm-hmm. sparingly. Like that's why I liked it. Like you know, there's there's good parts like that. There were some fun parts with the bagpipes too. Yeah, the bagpipes were fun. Mm-hmm. It's like yeah. a little homage to Star Trek Rathacon, I guess. Like <laughs> when uh you know there's like a character death and they give him like a little funeral and that with bagpipes. Like, that's kind of how I uh, interpreted it anyway. <laughs> mm. It's like science fiction. I don't know if that's in the book. <laughs> d- d- does anyone know? <laughs> I've not read yeah, the source None of us read it. I yeah. haven't delved into the book yet. Um, so my to-do list. But I just thought that was, yeah, I thought that was a cool touch. Mm-hmm. There's some like really cool imagery, and especially when the bagpipes are playing like at that, uh, the battle scene toward yeah. the middle. Just running and blaring yeah. music, you know, the... There's, uh, there's parts of the recipe that like are there epic, in the film. Like a, I just like a wish spaceship it, was like crashing. I just yeah, wish it was more like in the service of something. Epic imagery. Yeah, like the, there's it's a in sequence service of the story there. of Paul Atreides, which is just yeah, like it's, you it's know a very like a archetypal. Story. It's a very like archetypal like guy coming up, guy coming a hero. I guess <laughs> you know we're only part one. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> don't know. I'm uh, yeah. I see those sequences, and I'm like, man, like this is a great audio visual moment but in the greater context of the film i really just don't give a shit about why anything's happening and it's kind of a problem it's a me problem i'll admit that but like fuck i wish it wasn't yeah i I like that whole invasion sequence because it's kind of what propels paul into the next stage of his story because it's like his whole family is pretty much wiped out everything he knows like it's like the next step to it and it reveals also like that it was basically a trap. They were just they were sent there to die, just to be wiped out. Yeah. And there's this there's something scary about that. This just, just the, to start the whole conflict, imagery of it. Yeah, and, mm-hmm. yeah uh-huh. very the, the orange. Villain. Yeah, lots of fire. I like. It's like the only bit of action really in the movie. Like for the most part, <laughs> the only bit of like grand action you'd expect when watching like a blockbuster like this. That was it. There's like a little fight scene toward the end. Oh, it's very. There's a there's a pretty fun sort subtle. of uh, worm scene early on, which is kind of action. It's a it's a fun mm-hmm. tension filled scene with the the those like uh, machines that pick up the the sand crawlers or whatever like malfunctioning. So then you got the whole saving the team and whatnot. That stuff was yeah. cool. I, I like that a lot. And sure, how would you feel about like the hand to hand combat with like the swords and they had these shields? Where you could like, bl- it was like blue if you hit it, but you could penetrate yeah, it. I that, guess if you, that was one if you were like strong enough, <laughs> or if you hit um, it at like the right angle, it would turn red and you go like, and then it would kill you. 
How'd you yeah. feel about that? <laughs> it's kind of awkward. <laughs> but this seems like something that I need to like read the wiki page on or have explained yeah. in the book because it's something that original eighties movie proper stumbles on too. It's like the the shield scene in like the original eighties one is hilarious. It's like, can't wait. <laughs> it's it's ridiculous. Um, yeah, the Lynch one is terrible. When I first saw this, this I, much I, better. I was like, is, are they doing this because of the rating and they can't show like blood and like true violence or whatever? Because it, it's like hordes of people being having like the the throats cut and it's like violent it's it's an invasion that they're trying to take everyone out but you don't really see too much blood or whatever but yeah it, there is something kind of visually messy when when it, there's like the two waves like clashing and there's like the red and blue like <laughs> that wasn't fully working for me <laughs> yeah it was, it was fine i was just more like confused as to like look, what what quite is the technology here what is what is it's, even the purpose of these shields it's like they can't I th it's it's I think they're I think they're supposed to kind of explain why like people don't use guns on each other. They block things that yeah, are fast. Yeah, like, they shoot Oscar Isaac with something, remember? So it's like okay, it's so they like, have the technology to, to like pierce the, through their shield. But it's not. But it shot him with something that like went slower as it went into him. It was like burrowing into it, kind of. Yeah, so it had to like, like the penetrate speed. the shield. That, yeah right which is silly but still it did exist <laughs> but, you know <laughs> or you could just shoot them with like a cannon <laughs> yeah fucking blow them up you just fucking blow them up yeah. like <laughs> suffocate them in a goop grenade that was just a little it doesn't take away from the movie at all i was just i kept thinking about that technology yeah throughout. it was just one of the few like, times where i was visually confused it was kind of weird as yeah. opposed to like most of the world mm. building i find fascinating yeah like there's this fight scene with jason momoa like uh, he uses the shield and they penetrated i guess i, I guess I, that was fine i like the action scene toward the end more uh, where they were just fighting and there was no shield or like any mm -hmm. of that kind of technology <laughs> like uh -huh. they just you know like more bare bones yeah yeah that was actually another one of my uh dings against it was that sacrifice aquaman scene was uh didn't really hold much emotion or yeah you know or really hit in any way um he might not really be dead. That's kind of the sense I got. But that's the thing, yeah. I don't, I don't want to come too hard on some mm. of the things, depending on what comes later, you know. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely got the sense he could come back. Yeah, I don't know. Because if he doesn't, then it's not exactly like the the deepest character or anything. He serves his purpose. He, yeah. he needs to be in the story so uh, uh, Paul has some kind of background on... The uh, the I keep forgetting their names. The the faction that lives yeah, there already. The Fremen. The Fremen. Fremen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because he goes to meet them kind of off screen. Yeah. Yeah, he's like gets intel on them. He lives with them, so he knows what they're about and how they fight and everything. Yeah. So Paul has you know some idea of where to go and what to do once the calamity hits. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm yeah, I don't know the the characterization. It's not like the strongest thing about it. Like that's not what I connected to the most. It's definitely like the atmosphere. Uh, I like the music, the the visuals. Yeah, um, the, all the characters are like they're just fine. Archetype archetypal's a good word for yeah. it. They just like all kind of Ar fit. Archetypical. Archetype. Yeah. <laughs> it's just fine. Yeah. yeah. I suppose they're um, archetypal, but they're enhanced by the world building for me. And yeah, by that, some of them are enhanced by the actors, like Oscar Isaac, yeah, and the, the actors Baron. Too. Like I said, there's a lot of good characters like that, the more tertiary side characters. And yeah, that world is really cool. The world is a character in and of itself, mm -hmm. and the sandworms and all that shit. It's actually crucial to everything. Why the fuck does Mr. Isaac not have an Oscar yet? Maybe for this movie. I don't Probably think not. so. <laughs> he does a great job in it, though, honestly. I mean, he really separates yeah. himself and makes him distinguishable from other characters he's played just in the way he speaks. Like, it's good, really great performance in this yeah. movie. So there's no reason why you shouldn't yeah. get a nom, but it's not, I don't think this is a performance nom movie. So, right. Maybe card counting. Although they don't like movies like that. It's a little too dark. Yeah. We'll see. I don't think that'll be nominated. It should be. Yeah. And this, too. This this might get nom nominations for like visual effects, visual effects. cinematography. I thought the visual music. effects were noticeably worse than Blade Runner twenty forty nine. Really, I was about to ask what you thought of the visual effects. Yeah, some shots I could see what you're saying, but like the the spaceship shots, I thought were excellent. 
I mean, like yeah, there's some shots like, that look great. I when just, they were like, blowing up, especially. Like, that was fucking cool. I never had a moment in Blade Runner 2049 where I was like, that looks like kind of weird CG thing, you know? But I had a few of those in mm-hmm. Dune, and I was like, ah, shit, I guess the actors really ate up a lot of the budget, didn't they? And also in 2049, <laughs> they, you know, you can look at the behind the scenes footage. There's a lot of surprisingly practical ways that they yeah, achieved those. The effects, practical right? stuff so. in this looks cool. I think it was the yeah. same kind of it's, thing it's here scale, with the models. Less, yeah. I think this is more ambitious with the creatures and the spaceship, mm-hmm. like the space travel, on the the Dune setting. Like it's much more ambitious with that stuff. The battle scenes. Like that was like the only issue. Like the shot of Timothy Chalamet, like in the battle, and that like, looked the, like shit. Like I was just about to face. mention that. Yeah, that did look that like shit. fucking awful. Yeah, yeah that, that looked like shit. Like holy shit. And they they like show that in the trailer. Like it's oh, really? a, you know one of the best oh, moments. No. Yeah, sure, like yeah. really. His head's yeah, like weirdly proportioned. Moment. It doesn't look like it should fit in his helmet. <laughs> <laughs> I forgive it more so because it's not really a, a scene in this movie. It's like a flash forward yeah, to something that's just, going to happen in the fucking, future. Yeah, yeah. It's a vision. It's just a I coincidence it that then. <laughs> his vision looks like shit CG. It's so <laughs> coincidental that that's how he sees it's not real. <laughs> yeah. It's a vision. It's like Free yeah. Guy when he's like watching himself in the oh, TV. God. <laughs> it's like a seed shot. It is a rare occurrence, though. I think for the most part, the the implementation of the the visual effects and how obscured they often are, just enough, just in the right way, so it that everything kind of fits the environment. You're never particularly pulled out by bad CG. Um, aside from a couple times, like the one you said, but like the whole the, those uh, ruffle copters that are flying around. I thought they were cool, cool as fuck. Like the action that came from those. So and... impractical. <laughs> the ruffle gums. <laughs> They're so impractical. No one would design that. Oh, like, no one would manufacture oh, 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 that. Yeah, that's what I was if thinking. I, if this were a film, <laughs> if this was, if this was a Ralph Bakshi animated film, those would feel right at home, and I wouldn't be complaining about it at all. But this film is going for such a serious, serious dark tone, where I'm just like, those just showing up. I'm like, really. Come on. Yeah, it's it, it, it doesn't match the rest of the film in tone. And yeah, I get it. It's source <laughs> material. You got to adapt it from the book. Yeah. Maybe you should consider what tone you're adapting yeah, I, the book into then. I don't know. With things like that, I, I, I felt like, you know, you could make like much. a good you could make like a good parody out of this movie it looks like so a space stupid. Bulls kind it looks of movie. So dumb. Yeah. Oh, well, I was thinking of that with like some of the costumes like the Bene Gesserit. They have like these really tall like hats or hoods. Like I was thinking like you could like extend it up like off the off the screen like it's out of frame, like really tall. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I love those ruffle copters and like the, the action when they like fold their wings back. I love that you call them that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember what they're actually called, but that it is but, maybe mildly self aware. Dragonfly helicopters. <laughs> the yeah. dragonfly ones. Yeah. But yeah, when they fold their wings back in the action scene with Aquaman flying around in one, it's like a really good action scene. Seem, it seems like such an inefficient use of energy in order to get flight. Like, what the fuck? Are, they, oh, yeah, for it's, sure. It's, it's, it's got to be not very uh, spice efficient or whatever. <laughs> like, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> Spice yeah, I guess I guess it just didn't bug me too much when you have like the big flying guy and the, the voice and all this. I don't know. It's, it, well, that, that side of it didn't pull me out as much. Yeah, <laughs> there's, there's some silly stuff. I don't know. There was a box that hurts you when you put your uh, thing in it. Yeah, th- this is one where I guess <laughs> I, my, uh, reading around it made the scene better. Yeah. Um, cause I think what is happening is the Bene Gesserit, like all the woman character is making him feel the pain or something. Oh. And it's if he can hold his hand in the box. Um, and fight that that urge to, uh, you know, the animal urge to yeah. tray. He's into BDSM. He's fine. Yeah, what's the what's that scene on YouTube? Yeah. Broken down. It's up to it interpretation. It but yeah, that's what they're going for. I think that's what makes it work. You have to like think about it. <laughs> but the execution of that scene and how they execute on the voice concept and in in these videos where he's talking about it, he's describing like. Because in the 80s version, when they use the voice, it's like an awkward, like, oh, then they're a zombie and they slowly walk from one side of the room to the other. Like, that being sounds fun. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> but then you contrast it with here and it's just such a quick, snappy, you're, you're kind of locked with Paul from his perspective and you're just shoved yeah. into the next scene and it's like it's delirious. Cool. And it's, yeah, it's really effective. Yeah, the presentation the and stuff. That's like some of the most creative stuff in the movie. Yeah, like just that scene yeah. with the box. That's like one of the best scenes. Yeah, and the yeah, box the itself, apparently actor, it's accurate really to the, the book. Yeah. Mm. It's just a box. Like, there's nothing in it. 
<laughs> or you don't. I guess you don't know what's in it. But yeah, yeah. I, I took it as just like a mind trick kind of thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. Like the yeah. force. Mm-hmm. All right. What uh, I think we're all done talking about this, unless there's any other shit. That you Gotti want to say, out of right? ten. Yeah, I think we talked about it a while. <laughs> it's yeah. a it's a long movie for no reason. So well, because people are <laughs> really looking to, forward yeah. to it. Make it longer. That's what people yeah. want. I mean, finish yeah. the fucking story. If it's long well, yeah. because of <laughs> that, the then fucking do that. <laughs> I don't know. Kill Bill Volume One's an hour and fifty-one minutes. That's like forty minutes less than this, and I can think of like a billion times more plot beats and you know just things that the character does. Like the pacing's so different. I that you know that it's a very different film, but like I don't, I don't know. That's kind of what I want. Do out you of not it. think they should prioritize the accuracy of that book in the same way you would for like Lord of the Rings? I don't give a shit about the book. You're supposed to translate it no, to a the, film. The, but that's the story, though. You know, like the the Dune story. You got to do it right. Yeah. Well, how does it? If I'm a person that's never read the book, how would I know that it's accurate to the book? Like, I'm not saying they should take liberties and change it into something completely different. I'm saying you don't need to include every single time a character farted for no reason, you know, like. <laughs> well, I found the kind of obtuseness to be alluring in terms of this is just scratching the surface of this universe. And from my understanding with the way the books go, and mm -hmm. it feels like it's a small part of a big thing. And I find that's really interesting. I, I would I would be more in your lane if this were a mini series and this was the first two or three episodes. It could be the exact same. It could be li literally nothing's changed other than just the format and how it's broken up. I think I would have enjoyed mm. it more. When you're selling this as a single film, even though it says part one, and then they change the title to remove the part one so that people bought the tickets, whatever. Like, that's a completely different expectation as a viewer. It's a completely different way yeah. to digest time flowing and pacing than if you you know the implication was like oh this is like a six part mini series or something like that would have been that would have worked out better for me experience wise i didn't digest it as i well. was on the same page as you until they confirmed part two was happening and then i felt more confident like okay now i feel safe i can kind of invest in this universe i can i revisited the film had a different experience had subtitles on so i could actually tell what was like peak said <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Subtitles help. Yeah, there's only two. Apparently, there's only going to be two. That's good. That's what they said. <laughs> That'd be weird if yeah. they split it into no, no more, <laughs> three more or something. Yeah, but yeah, I'm I'm fully well, expecting to have my though. perspective changed yeah, in are. some way the next time I watch it. I just don't want to watch it really. Maybe probably until the next movie is already out. You know. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's fair enough because it's probably going to take a while now. Because uh, unlike it's something like or Kill something? Bill or. Yeah, yeah, from my understanding, it's like the end of 2023 that is currently, which is, you know, a long time. Yeah, it'll be good. I heard they're going to try and compete with Paw Patrol 2 in theaters. <laughs> so I don't know if, I don't know if they're going to make their money. I think more people are going to see Paw Patrol 2. I, yeah, I just find this really interesting. Like, uh, I can't think of another example of this type of story being split up and then just never having any concrete confirmation yeah. i think that's so funny and weird but i'm glad we're getting a part two otherwise this would just be a a bizarre standalone half a book movie yeah that would be <laughs> like that, there's, that a, there's, would a, there's be another timeline where that exists <laughs> yeah, can you imagine how frustrating <laughs> dune how frustrated dune fans would be if they just got like a little taste a little cocktease oops <laughs> of what they could have had yeah there would be so <laughs> many change.org petitions <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would do nothing. Yeah, <laughs> go fund me. <laughs> um, I'm doing part two. All right, six out of ten for me. It could change up. It could change down. I don't know. I'm not going to see it again for a while, but I I will be seeing it again before part two comes out. Uh, some great stuff in it. Some cancerous stuff in it as well. It's fine. <laughs> I'm higher than that. Okay. My current thought process is. Before a part two was confirmed, I was like, I'm just not going to rate this because I just don't know how to rate half story. Uh, right. <laughs> then, now I know that's coming. Okay. Um, I, I, I say four star. There's, there's, there are too many little things that bother me, like the, the music, like certain shots, certain choices here and there, certain... Some of the obtuseness can be a bit much, but I'm liking it more and more the more time I'm I'm spending trying to figure out this world and to spend time in it and i do want to spend more time in it but we haven't really mentioned the pacing but for how long it is i i thought it flew by even that first time and it was just more of a oh is that it that i want more 
And yeah, uh, so four star, I could see it going up depending on whatever the part two is like mm -hmm. in the future. Uh, there's same there's as a you. lot of potential here. Yeah, I'd go eight out of ten also, same as you. It's mainly Timothy Chalamet. <laughs> him and this French Dispatch, I don't like him that much. <laughs> Uh, that yeah, scene in the tent, yeah, that was a strong scene. That was like his one scene where he was like really good. But yeah, Oscar Isaac was well? good, the Baron. Yeah, the box, yeah. yeah. Charlotte Rampling's in that scene too, yeah. Uh, yeah. Rebecca Ferguson, I thought she was like really good. I heard some criticism about her. I thought she was good. Yeah, she plays a really interesting character. Conflicted. And yeah, I like the music. I like the visuals. I liked all that stuff. It's a really great like science fiction movie. It's better than most of this shit you're gonna get it's probably better than eternals <laughs> probably <laughs> <For sure. laughs> yeah so yeah definitely check this out dank eight out of ten closer to a nine we all saw last night in soho the new edgar wright film and i watched it and was like more like edgar wrong what do you think Ooh. edgar <laughs> can do no wrong yeah i kind of went in knowing that it was getting a mixed reception and yeah for that first act i was kind of like oh maybe i'm gonna be uh like outside of the the norm opinion here and spoiler talk also mm -hmm. oh yeah yeah we might as well do full spoilers it seemed very different for him it seemed like a different kind of movie for him yeah it was. it's still familiar, familiar <laughs> not as much him. of a comedy in that it wasn't good <laughs> it's, yeah. is that what you mean well in a way yeah but not as much of a comedy overtly and at least not overtly there's funny parts um, yeah it's got comedic elements even so. baby drivers like a crime comedy like yeah yeah i don't know this isn't but really yeah. his shtick yeah i guess that's where i was also getting hung up on it whereas yeah before the comedy has been balanced with like what like action or it's whatever. been shrouded in layers of irony whenever he's trying to yeah, do like yeah. any serious yeah, tones the, mm -hmm. it's saved that's him so many other times and even in that way it's usually stronger like even the crime elements are like stronger than like the kind of horror elements in this movie and this is much more of a horror like a straight up horror movie it's a baby he's trying horror. to it's scare you horror. With like kind of yeah. haunted house type shit, with like zombies and like <laughs> red lighting, yeah. it's like a goosebumps book. <laughs> bed sheets. It's like oh, okay, Except it's a lot of like to prostitution. That's like the only adult thing about it. Yeah, right. Yeah. But it's like very um, sanitized, very lame. <laughs> kind of yeah, yeah lame there is, is what is I was a, thinking. Like a slow build up of tension going on for that for the first act. I was really enjoying it. Was, it was going somewhere. It was building up something I liked. I, I really enjoyed that main character. I thought she was really likable and and vulnerable at the beginning. And I was liking where she was going and her whole fashion angle and all this. But yeah, it, it's the it's the horror stuff I'm hung up on because during the scenes where it's it's becomes more of a horror movie and it's it's trying to I guess scare you. And I just didn't find that stuff effective at all. Like it wasn't scaring me. It wasn't thrilling me or like Shaun of the Dead is obviously like <laughs> rooted in horror but it's not trying to actually scare well actually to be honest that film scares me more than this one yeah like, <laughs> yeah that, that it's scary where he's ripped apart in the window still like that it's like traumatizing yeah, his, stuff his mom and, dies yeah like <laughs> yeah 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 true yeah there's actually true, a lot disturbing more kind of stuff, yeah. yeah much more disturbing than what comes of these kind of zombie ghost men that are flying around that they they represent something um i guess more evil than how they come across they're just kind of like just zombies yeah right the zombie part is so like <laughs> it doesn't really enhance in. the fear i'm sorry like how many f how many fucking movies are we going to get where it's just like main character is hallucinating some things and nobody believes them and then they go to a library and do some research <laughs> and find a thing and then there's like a bait and switch and it turns out the person that they thought was evil wasn't evil and then the blah 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 like how many fucking times are we going to do it? How am I honestly supposed to see this film and be like, "Oh yeah, Edgar Wright was really inspired to make this movie." Why did he even make it? Like what the who the fuck <laughs> does that who who has this idea in their head and is like yeah this will this will be great <laughs> like what are you doing dude? it is weird considering the the cliches he'd make fun of in the in the cornetto trilogy yeah everything else especially. that he's made is just protected by layers of irony and as soon as he strips that away he makes a shit movie 
Well, it's part of what I was so excited about with this movie because, yeah, it was being sold as, yeah, it's his first proper foray into horror. And it's, it's kind of like the inverse of like an Ari Aster where it's like, come on, let's see, let's see something else. Let's see what we can, you know, what, what, what we can do if you explore a different genre here. But yeah, it doesn't sure, come together. Yeah. It, it really doesn't no. towards the end, especially that that final scene in the house with the with the twist reveal um, and the way that plays out. It it, it removes a lot it's of so the subtlety. Stupid. Yeah, a lot of the subtlety that was baked into that predictable that intro, like first act. Where yeah, because the execution of that I thought was stupendous. Like she goes into the sixties for the first time, yeah. and there's like Those really creative were awesome. like camera work, and yeah. Yeah, and there's like a lot of intrigue and mystery and like, what's going on? Where's this going? I really felt like it was going somewhere and that it, and that it had a point to make too because the main character is rooted in this sort of nostalgia for the 60s. She loves the fashion and everything it represents. And I thought it was going to be about illuminating the dark side of, uh, you know, the truth of what a lot of the stuff in the 60s like <laughs> is going on behind the mm-hmm. red curtain and... There's like a ton of stuff, and it's it's really like Fantasizing relevant. Fantasizing about to... different times. Yeah, yeah, and just the general nostalgia obsession that yeah. everyone has. It's, it's a real midnight in Paris. That's a good core to a story for me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it, it feels like by the time you are like getting to the old lady stabbing her boyfriend in the <laughs> that was really dumb in the stomach and whatnot. It gets yeah. kind of campy the silly. Character was super... With without the layers of irony mm-hmm. and without the self awareness that his other mm-hmm. films have had. It's like, I, I wish that this same movie was making fun of its stupidity, right? And near the beginning, <laughs> mm-hmm. it almost seemed to. Like, there was a comedic element with her bully and just how many times she's just going to get bullied by this one girl. And eventually, that was that kind of got old pretty quick. You know, I was like, oh, really? She's just going to breathe and sneer at her? Like, okay, whatever. Yeah, but, like, that kind of builds up to nothing, much, doesn't it? Yeah, it really it doesn't even matter. <laughs> it doesn't go anywhere. Yeah, the most it goes to is the spiking scene, which... Again, also doesn't really yeah. add too much. It's it's a misdirect. This th- mm-hmm. that's what this movie does a lot. Yeah, she has a she has an incorrect like vision. Like when she sees the dude stabbing her other version of herself. I mean, what she thought was herself. When she sees the dude stabbing the woman on the bed, and then later when the reveal happens that it's like, oh, the landlord was blah, 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 blah. Then she gets the same vision again, and she's like, oh, I was wrong. It was actually she did the stabbing like the only reason there's any plot in this film is because you're having these visions so Mm -hmm. for there to be one pivotal scene where it's like oh this one was wrong and we're not gonna explain why it was just she was like i don't know she was just confused that day but it it literally only exists for the purpose of misdirecting the audience and nobody else i mean like i guess the main character but Mm -hmm. the audience by extension you know it just seems yeah, so the, slimy the and dishonest seems to be and on manipulative. The, on the like, what the fuck is that? Yeah, why is the it's not even a cool twist? Everything. It isn't. It's not even like no. crazy or interesting. It's like, oh, you're making a point, I guess. But that would have been so much more interesting. I agree with you, Alex, that it removes the subtlety. That would have been so much more interesting if it was like subtext to read into about the film. If we got something like a horror movie where later there, you know, people could be discussing about like, oh, what does this mean? Sort of, oh, it's about you know objectification of women in prostitution and blah 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 blah. Right. Mm-hmm. That would have been cool, but it kind of just spells it out and does so in a very dishonest and <laughs> stupid, stupid and, annoying yeah, stupid way. Stupid and I, annoying. What, yeah. a, what an awful third yeah. act. Yeah, I, I actually found this uh, article to do with this exact thing. It's like a Collider article, so take it or leave it what you want. But it has a quote from uh, the, the writer who co-wrote with Edgar Wright on this. Um, quoted saying... That original twist was always there, and that was, for me, the key idea to the female empowerment, Wilson Cowan said. I'd never seen a villain like that before. I'd never seen a villain where I don't agree with what she does, but I empathize with what she does. That was such a crucial element that hooked me in. I think that without that twist, I might not have been as interested in the film. Oh, she, hadn't seen, she hasn't seen a lot of movies then. Holy yeah, shit. that's the thing, because I was like, wait, what? That's like so many villains, right? Like, <laughs> That's a good villain. Yeah. Yeah, but that, the whole <laughs> movie really is like built around that twist. It almost feels like that's the hook. And it's not that special, at least in my mind. As far as like horror yeah, movies that, or kind of horror movies that come out this year, I enjoyed James Wan's uh, Malignant like much more. It was much more self-aware. Yeah, I did finally watch it. it. Yeah, like it does actually build to something really cool. 
like that ending is great like even if it's over the top like at least it's fun and this yeah. doesn't build to anything mm. this is like it gets worse as it goes it along peters off. It, it yeah it does kind of yeah. peter off and like once it like once it throws down its hand like oh that's what this movie's about you're like oh that's really kind of dumb wow i don't care <laughs> yeah, yeah i don't care and it's not like a good subversion like the movie doesn't yeah the way it's in a way that's not... like a in a good way <laughs> it's not okay. it's like oh that's actually i don't like <laughs> mm-hmm. where this movie's going now but i guess that's what's gonna happen and, and then it plays out and you're well, like yeah, okay <laughs> there's another misdirect isn't there there's the other misdirect with the old man who you're supposed to think is <laughs> that was so stupid uh, young doctor or old doctor who <laughs> he was a bad actor i'm just gonna say his so performance was bad. They, he just gets like hit by a car. Like it's like Wish Upon, like or any <laughs> shitty horror movie. They just like get hit by a car. Like, yeah, fateful finding. It's always so dumb. Like if you're trying to scare someone, don't just like have a character get hit right. by like a random final car. destination. In Final Destination, it's a little more pivotal. Like that's kind of the point of the killer. Doesn't the main character kind of instigate? him being hit by the car too like would he be doing all that if she wasn't yeah, like, kind of her him? fault she was like arguing with him <laughs> interrogating him on false information yeah I, I think that was kind of the point because she's already like oh they think i'm murdering people yeah right you know but then does it make her more likable as a character it adds something complicated to the character but they never like address it or it doesn't, it doesn't go anywhere it doesn't build There's a lot of things anywhere. that yeah. don't go anywhere <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah 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 <sighs> And then with the whole fucking, re- like, e- even during the twist scene, it's like, okay, I'm already pissed off at, like, the twist and how it was revealed. And then they do that stupid fucking dumb cliche, like, hey, there's a fire, but it's going to be burning for, like, ten minutes while we settle this resolution of the film. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, you should understand how quickly smoke will engulf a place. Like, honestly, I think it's genuinely, like, this might be, like, ooh, alarmist Adam or whatever. I think it's genuinely kind of irresponsible that so many films are painting, like, oh, there's a house fire of, like, oh, yeah, you can just hang out (laughs) and the fire's burning for a while. Like, because there's certain things (laughs) where it's, like, if you don't see that in real life, like, most people haven't experienced indoor fires, right? And so Mm. if people have only seen something in a movie, they might get conditioned in a weird way to expect something. Like, when people hear gunshots for the first time, if you interview people, like, that survive mass shootings, they're, like, I didn't know that's what guns sounded like. It doesn't sound like anything like in a movie. Like we condition people in weird ways of of what to expect by what we put mm-hmm. in films, and I think it's fucking irresponsible sure. to to portray <laughs> that's fire like that because it's not just like stupid and unrealistic, but it will get people yeah. killed if that's what they're expecting. If if you if you got the stomach for it, search up uh, the footage of the station nightclub fire. But uh, that comes with a content warning, obviously. Yeah. But if if you're right. interested in being paranoid in every public place you enter enough to look at the fire exits as soon as you get in, then that's a video to watch. But it might save your life one day. So there's my little yeah. PSA, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> be cool about be yes. cool about fire safety. Yeah, <laughs> be cool yeah, about fire yeah. safety. <laughs> this movie was cancer man yeah it's, it's even thinking about it it's just like not, there's really not much to it because it is all structured around that twist and if that twist doesn't work it doesn't work what do you have left like it's, you can't yeah then you can't really yeah. revisit it even because then the stuff i loved on that first watch for that first half where i was like really liking what it was building up to it, it yeah it almost means nothing we've talked about this before where the when, when the opening is stronger than the ending, or if the ending really peters out, it, it always yeah. hurts it a lot more when it's weighted that way, because it's the last taste of it. That, that, yeah, we have talked about that before. We like movies that get better as they go along, like like *Malignant*, where if it like built to something really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like that's why I liked it. Or even like yeah, I said yeah. before, like, like setting up kind of what you are at the beginning in terms of like a movie. If the first ten minutes of this movie had set up some kind of paranormal thing, I don't know if it did that well enough. Because at least you know what kind of movie you're getting, you know, because then it becomes this thing where I don't know. I don't know if I really like where it went. <laughs> you know? I don't care if it's set up paranormal aspects at the beginning. I care that the tone is weirdly different. I feel like I feel like the tone sure. of the movie changed. Throughout. Definitely tonally. Like, that's not necessarily a bad thing, I guess. But it was it just felt like it didn't really know what it wanted to be throughout and then kind of eventually ended. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. It was sort of the wrong type of horror. Yeah, it was very paint by numbers, very boring, predictable. The tone of it, honestly, at points reminded me of Velvet Bolt Buzzsaw. Yeah, which you I know? really didn't like. Velvet oh, Buzzsaw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Velvet Buzzsaw was cancer. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, this is maybe a little movie. better. I, did, I, did, I actually I enjoyed the way this movie was made too much for um for that movie yeah. to be like conjured in my mind because it, it it does all fall on the writing to me because I, I thought the production design was excellent and there's loads of like really memorable visuals and good like practical stuff with all the mirrors and that dance sequence with the the three people and two of them playing the same character like subbing out is and it all being in camera and stuff it's really impressive and creative and what you want to see from Edgar Wright but it doesn't serve something like the Cornetto trilogy or Baby Driver do in the same yeah. way so yeah or, does, or even Scott Pilgrim you feeling hollow. I like Scott Pilgrim much more than this I forgot that that yeah. was a movie but I liked that too <laughs> Scott Pilgrim <laughs> I'd be down to rewatch it's definitely it his weakest film if you uh, if you don't count that western I've never seen that that western that you made the western he made a oh, western yeah. Yeah, right. It's like his first movie. I've never, I've only looked oh. at it on IMDb. I've oh, okay. never actually checked it out. Early, or uh, yeah. he made that show. I he love Space. Show. Space, yeah. But... Space is yeah, awesome. Space. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Everybody check well, out Space. Yeah. Let's check out Space, not this. <laughs> Very awkward film for Edgar Wright. It's like an Edgar Wright film, but also trying to be like a, a genuine horror movie, not like a funny one like Shaun of the Dead. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It just seemed weird. Like even from the trailers, I was just like, "This is not my thing." I don't know. I'm not really digging this. I mean, <laughs> at it's all. just it, it puts the rest of his career into like this weird retrospective criticism for me, where I realize like everything else he's made has been shrouded in irony, <laughs> and he's like everything <laughs> else he's made before this also wasn't like an original idea, and he kind of just <laughs> you know he makes things that are like. Oh, funny poke fun at itself. Uh, this is a comedy, but also we're doing, you know, a lot of reference humor. You know, we're doing parody. <laughs> sure. And it really just seems like that was that held up his career. <laughs> like, not to say that, like, this was like the most poorly shot film ever. A lot of it did look bad. There was some bad acting. There was some bad uh, effects. There was some. You know, the story was bad. Like, there's a lot about this where it's like, <laughs> dude, go back to comedy maybe or something. I don't know. I'm I'm happy that he tried something different, but if this, this did not work. Sure, <laughs> sure. Yeah. It makes, me, it makes me realize, like, the talent of, like, all those other people he worked with, like Simon Pegg and Nick Frost and Scott Pilgrim, like Chris Evans, uh, you know, all the other actors he got yeah. in that, Michael Sarah. Like, they really elevate the material of... Yeah, like this, it's just like him trying something different. It's, I don't know if like Anya Taylor Joy is like as funny as uh Simon Pegg, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, I don't know if he's like capable of working with that actor the same way. Uh, yeah. it, they just made like it's just fine. I, I don't even hate the movie. It's just like very average. Even in his other comedy films, like the directing is so important, right? So I, I don't want to like mm. understate what he does for those, yeah. but like whatever he was doing here it just did not work like it did not gel well with his style there were actually some sequences in this film when she's going she's walking through the hallway and in a single shot the camera is like panning into each of the doors as it's moving forward and you see like oh in one door blah there was kind of like a shining reference someone was getting their dick sucked i guess Mm -hmm. and then it goes to the end of the hall (laughs) and these like swooping camera motions it didn't fit well with the tone of what the film was going for. And I was just thinking like, man, if this was like, if there was some comedy in this scene, then those swooping fast camera motions would actually elevate what's happening, right? There's a lot of what he does as yeah. a director that really elevates the comedy that he's working with. He, he takes films that could be presented on easy mode and he does them on hard mode and it works out great. But for this film, it's just, mm-hmm. what the fuck? It had no self-awareness. I don't know what you were going uh-huh. for, dude. It does deflate from like the, the tension of those scenes when it's just like yeah all, all these like amazing camera angles and <laughs> swooping shots. It's a, it doesn't fit his style. It's better to oh, have yeah. like a more subtle, restrained style like a Soderbergh or like Tarkovsky. Like that that works much better for something like this. Yeah, I was almost expecting something like that. Yeah, Do you and maybe could have director been that. of photography was because I I looked it up before. It's a is it Chung the same Chung like, from The Handmaid and Old Boy Thirst. Cool. Yeah. But cinematography doesn't Talented. necessarily mean they were responsible for framing every shot no, you no. Know, or storyboarding. Like Cinematographer sure. can just be lighting, really, which I didn't really have much of an issue with. Yeah. Well, the, like, I guess lenses. my point is I don't see the, the any of the crew really as, as responsible for what went wrong. I, I see the, the story and the writing as the, yeah. as the biggest 
the biggest hang up the for Edgar me, writing <laughs> is, is is that it then can does he need to root his stories in comedy first and foremost it's a crutch it's but it works out at. really well for him and he's really good at it he's just yeah because i thought with baby driver he was going out of, i mean it was still very Edgar Wright and full of his kind of ism yeah but... it was the, the, it was over the top and comedic but it was also like I don't know if I could pinpoint like an exact property that it was mirroring, but I think everybody has had the idea while listening to their earbuds throughout the day, like, oh, there should be a movie where someone does things to the beat while they listen to their ear. Like, I had that thought. Everybody's had yeah. that thought, right? Yeah, so even yeah, again, yeah. he's not really working with like the most original concepts. And then in this newest film, it's like the most derivative paint by numbers story you could possibly fucking fart out. Mm. Whatever. This could just be a fluke. Perhaps he'll direct the next like fucking Ari Aster movie, you know, like per perhaps he'll he'll do like a crazy <laughs> A24 horror thing. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. I think he should go back to comedy, you know, nothing to be ashamed of. You've had a great career and you're a very talented director. Yeah. 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 Hot Fuzz is perfect. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Charlotte dead. Scott yeah. Polgram. I mean, yeah, this is his uh, first kind of miss for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It was a miss from like when I heard about it. <laughs> I was like, "This is not something I'm looking." Did any of to. you see the trailers? Yeah, I didn't. I People were telling me that it was like it spoiled too much or something. I don't know, but I didn't watch it. Oh, okay. Did I didn't like get anything out of the trailers. Okay. I was just like, "This is so odd." Like, this is the guy, this is the guy who made Shaun the Dead. <laughs> like, what the fuck? Hmm. And then ending with her like on the getting her like fashion stuff. It seems like what. It, it does seem like there's just less to it. Like it seems, oh, so she got like a happy ending, and it's like, what was the what was the point in in, in this? What was the building? <laughs> there was no point. There? I have yeah. no idea why he made this movie. <laughs> I don't know what he saw. Yeah, that was like, oh, I want to communicate this. I want to share this to the world. Like, what did you? I'm sorry, what? What was in here that you wanted it's to just, do? It was just <laughs> like, something different. Like, oh, you, you just recycled to show, a like, basic. I can plot. make a different kind of movie. I can make a movie that's like a horror I can movie, make a not a comedy. Movie. I can it make a movie scary. that's about like a bunch of like women. Shit. No, it wasn't scary. I, I, you know, like it was different to have a movie starring all women like that. That was interesting. Yeah, his first like woman uh, protagonist, which is cool. Yeah, he he wrote mostly women characters. Yeah, like uh, yeah, Anya Taylor Joy, the older version of her, the the uh, Thomas and McKenzie's character. He cited uh, "Don't Look Now" as an influence, which is huh. a film we have talked about on a I previous episode. That. That's yeah. silly. That's very. It's a much silly, better Edgar. film. Don't look now. <laughs> yeah, it is a much better film, for sure. Well, because it's in Soho, like that one's in Venice. <laughs> and, like I loved those mirror shots, but those fucking those ghouls or whatever just look. They looked like shit. You know, there's some bad looking stuff. In I really movie. didn't like the ending with the staircase, like the CGI yeah, the ghouls, staircase. That they was needed more. Glass. They needed something. For such like a visually oriented, like energetic director, like the, those ghouls, they, they needed something else going on. They, they were so just like <laughs> mindless zombie. Their presence yeah, was weak. It, it wasn't scary. It was very. Yeah. It just didn't add anything. The visuals didn't add anything to the movie. Like if those shots weren't there of like the zombies or the staircase, it wouldn't be a different film in my mind. <laughs> it's the same story. <laughs> like it's just like it's just thrown in there for the sake of it because they had the money. Yeah, I weirdly, guess, it was reminding me of like World's End with like the the alien invasion. Yeah, stuff, World's End like, wasn't really a comedy. silly and goofy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. World's yeah, End much better than this. I thought. I think that's. More yeah, of a no, comedy. I like World's End because yeah. I think the tone's appropriate. Those villains aren't yeah, scary. Yeah. Is part of the problem I have. With World's End, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and it's, it Go saves back to itself Legoland by being a comedy. Fuck off, back to Legoland. <laughs> Whatever they yeah. say. <laughs> yeah, that's the line. Fuck it's, off back it's to a Legoland. Crush, but it works <laughs> it can make something work really well, you know? Yeah. I mean I think it's great. If you're it's a medium where you're trying to entertain people, right? Like yeah. you have an original story, use comedy as like a a driving force, I guess, to tell it. Yeah. A, a lot of great filmmakers do it. Tarantino, fucking a lot of them. <laughs> mm. The Scorsese. Yeah, Scorsese's movies are usually really funny. They're funnier than most like comedies you see, right? Like Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah. <laughs> Even like yeah, Raging true. Bull is like really funny. Yeah, and it's yeah, and it's yeah, we already kind of pointed it out, but the dramatic elements in his in the Cornetto trilogy work surprisingly well when they do come out. So it's not like it's really held him back, really. 
Yeah. Unless he wants to just experiment with different types of stories, different genres, and not have yeah. But if he is, he really needs to like devote it. Like he needs to change his style to make it fit that this kind of story much more. Mm. Where it's something more subtle. Like you want to do a ghost story, okay? Do do something like The Exorcist, or do something like Paranormal Activity, where it's found footage, or like you know, embodies some other kind of horror style that doesn't make it feel like Shaun of the Dead. Yeah. Or like something like that. It's so like like you were saying, like the swooping camera shots and all this stuff. It's it's so cinematic. It it's butting heads with the the, the tension and the the horror. Yeah, especially the horror. Yeah, the subtlety is good in horror, I think. And there's nothing subtle. There is nothing subtle about this nothing movie. Not even one whatsoever. thing about it. <laughs> <You're right. Yeah. laughs> Everything about it is like in your face. It's really, it really, honestly, if if it weren't for, you know, some of the mirror shots, you know, a couple moments, and you know, the some dancing. of the acting. If it weren't for that, the it lighting. Just, like this feels yeah. like a kids' movie. It feels like a like the way that information <laughs> is presented. Ways, yeah. And like its whole approach yeah. to like yeah sexual abuse or whatever it feels like like a teenager movie. yeah it, it feels, feels like, like a fucking Dear Evan Hansen crowd like it's wait for them thing. like it's so sanitized like, why is this even like, rated okay. R you know we talked about Texas Chainsaw Massacre a few weeks ago like that is not a, a sanitized movie when it no. comes to that subject matter like it's really scary um, it's better in that way I think to be more in your face about it yeah. We yeah, like, did it need it. the all the violence at the end? With because I'm trying to think of like what actual gore would because I think it's an 18 in the UK, which is like one of the highest mm-hmm. ratings you can have. And I'm just, just thinking, like the like, stabbing scene. Yeah, there's the stabbing scene, and it goes crazy that last section with the old lady and <laughs> them showing all the stabbing. It's so but, silly. Like, did, <laughs> did it need that? Did it really need that like hot fuzz level of like just exploding heads and like. I don't know if it's <laughs> not really necessarily no. if it really serves it. Oh my god. In my province it's rated PG. <laughs> really? Yeah. That's interesting. It feels like a PG movie. Even though it's about that stuff. 13 plus yeah. Even though Quebec. it's got like the it's got like the blowjob and the uh Yeah, it's a short blow. It's very sexual in nature. Well, that's fine in Canada, I guess. <laughs> yeah, people have blowies. Oh, yeah. This is the province that suggested glory holes for safe pr- sex practice during COVID. Did you ever see that? There's like <laughs> really? a little, there's like a government uh graphic that's like, oh, here's ways to practice safe sex during COVID. And some of them were like mask or like blah 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 blah. There, but one was like use a glory hole. <laughs> it was like legitimately posted That's by our government. Hilarious. It was pretty funny. Yeah, yeah. Soho's rated R here, yeah, look at so definitely <laughs> an R rated movie here. Yeah, why not? I guess that's why I don't see the point. It's still rated R. Like, why, why shy away from it <laughs> at all? Yeah, and fucking CG faced ghoul people are not scary. So. Whatever. None of that it's scary. So None of it's report. interesting. Five yeah. out of ten. The most generous five out of ten I could possibly give, because I liked some of the fucking, uh, I don't know, the mirror shots and some of the acting wasn't bad. And I liked some of the music, but yep, five out of ten. That's as high as I'm giving it. Feels like I should give it a four, but yeah. whatever. You've uh, dodged a bullet today, Mister Wright. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm. I'm thinking I was too generous with my rating now because I just kind of rated this a three star, like six out of ten. But, um, right. <laughs> it might have to be a five for a, yeah. a two and a half star. Do it. Because um, I, I really can't justify where it goes. And I can't say I was satisfied with where it goes. But I just, I was really engaged for a, a certain section, the first part of the movie. Mm-hmm. But it's just, it's just not enough. I can't, I can't defend it beyond a good opening and some, some good direction and some, you know, some energetic choices or whatever. But yeah. Yeah, if I'm going down the middle. Mm-hmm. Two and a half. If Dune Part Two is as bad as the second half of this film, will you will you lower your rating for Part One? <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. All right. What do you think, Ralph? Yeah, we'll have to see. I'm like right with you. Five. Yeah. Five's all Five around. Out of ten. I guess so. It might go down. Maybe go up, but I doubt it. But it's just like a really dull movie. It's yeah, a forgettable and I just keep thinking like, movie. <laughs> yeah. I keep thinking with his other movies that, that there's so many little nuggets for people who are paying attention. Little like little <laughs> little mm-hmm. nuggies that like It's like he know, gave up foreshadow things. And, <laughs> yeah, that, he like, just gave up with this one. It, it is in this movie there's like a line where the 
the older lady mentions like, oh, the smell will rise at a certain time of the day where I guess that's foreshadowing the bodies under the ground or whatever. But it's, it's just not, it doesn't do it. It doesn't tickle the same. Yeah. And I don't want he to see it He inserted that in I, there I, for I, sure. I feel like watching it again would enhance it. In fact, it would probably do the opposite. Because mm -hmm. without that mm -hmm. twist and knowing that twist uh -huh. is coming, I mean. I'll end up seeing it again. Um, Soho? Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, I have some friends who want to see it. Oh. Because they like Edgar Wright. I'll watch it with them. Yeah, they're going to be disappointed because it's not funny <laughs> at all. <laughs> it's trying to be sometimes, but it's, yeah, it's mostly like. Mostly cringe and <laughs> mostly cringe. cringe. Yeah. It is mostly, mostly just like really eh. Mostly cringe. whatever. That's the perfect quote for the DVD. Yeah, because th there was someone in my audience who was like, who was laughing <laughs> a, lot a lot of cringe, even when it was trying to be a horror movie. Like he was, he was still laughing as if it was like jokes. And I was like, <laughs> what's, what's going on? Expectation. Like, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, I, yeah, yeah. I laughed accidentally when the old woman stabbed in the neck. <laughs> I laughed accidentally. It's not, there's not enough for that stuff, though. There needs to be way more self-aware horror shit like that. Like Malignant. Malignant was so self-aware, I felt. Much more so than this was. Certainly in the second half, it's very self-aware. Yeah, especially in the second half. Yeah. This was just not interesting. Even if yeah. it was self-aware, like, where's the where's the gore? Where's, where's the, the beef? <laughs> Malignant the has beef? that consistent no tone. Beef. It doesn't, like, betray itself. Uh-huh. Right. I don't know if I would call it. It isn't like embarrassed of what it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. Malignant just is what it is. Gojira. All right. It's time to talk about the recommendation from. Recommendation for episode 99. Yes. <laughs> Gojira is Godzilla. That's what it means in Japanese. Oh, is it now? Yeah. That's why I was saying it. <laughs> it was on HBO Max. That's, that's how I watched Ooh. it. Ooh. Um, yeah, 1954, right? That's the one we watched. We didn't watch... Um, Sorry, I watched the Roland oh, Emmerich what's version. What's the Roland Emmerich one? <laughs> the Roland Emmerich <laughs> one? Uh, what's, what's the other one I'm thinking of? I think it's Godzilla King of the Monsters. Yeah. That's like... It's basically There's the, the Gareth same Edwards movie. the Gareth one from like 2014. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I would call it director's cut. But there's like another version of this Godzilla movie. But we we all watched the 1954. Yeah. The Criterion one. The one you get a Criterion of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I just watched on, on the public domain. <laughs> oh! Yeah, that's where it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's probably, where I found it. Yeah, you probably find it like that. That version, just to say the difference, like it has like this like American point of view character instead. Oh. So it's like the same movie, except there's like a white guy, basically. <laughs> oh, yeah, I heard like, that. Oh, God, so what, like an Americanized version or something. Yeah, it's like the version they released for Americans. That's because so I guess funny. they think like we're racist. <laughs> like, we just won't... <laughs> oh, I hate these Japanese people. I won't, I won't watch a movie with them. I don't know how I can relate to someone that's <laughs> not stupidity. the same skin color as me. That's basically what yeah. the people back then thought. Of. Yeah. Oh, man. So they have like this white guy who's the point of view character who's like, explaining the point of the movie yeah but that's not the one we watched we yeah. watched the 1954 one <laughs> just to be clear and yes. that one is like a yes a japanese film it takes place in japan all japanese characters and it just follows them as they're attacked by a giant monster named godzilla and that's the plot <laughs> uh <laughs> it's pretty straightforward i think we all know like what it is mm -hmm. and i think it's great it's a very dark tone for like a monster movie at that period it's definitely much darker than like the sequels are <laughs> later on uh -huh. which we could talk about a little bit i was planning on like watching all of them but there's a point i just stopped because they're really bad and <laughs> i figured there's you so guys many. weren't gonna watch all of them either I yeah there's on, a like, ton DB, there's just so many of them like, yeah there are begin? different eras and <laughs> yeah it's not worth watching all of them because i think a lot of them are pretty bad uh not this first one i like the first godzilla but, you know, by the time you get to, like, Son of Godzilla. <laughs> so how many have you seen? <laughs> it's, it's, like, really... Uh, I, I honestly don't even know. But mm -hmm. Is there, like, a recently chronology? Recently I saw Son of Godzilla. There, yeah, there is. And there's, like, the four eras of Godzilla. That's what I was going to say. There's there's the Showa era, the oh, Heisei yeah. era, Heisenberg. the Millennium era, and then the Reiwa <laughs> The Ray era. William Johnson. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess you could okay. say it that way, too. And there's like 32 films. Yeah. Oh, cool. 
That's a lot. <laughs> Two. Wow. That's cr- yeah, I'm that's not crazy. Surprised, including but... these new ones, like <laughs> Dingle versus Kong, or is this Dingle? I'm gonna check for you. Yeah, when did they rename Godzilla to Dingle? No, it's it's not even <laughs> counting. It's counting like Shin Godzilla. <laughs> so just the Japanese ones then? Okay. Oh, but it is counting that like these sense. stupid animated ones, though. Oh. I guess they consider those canon. Because they're like big kaiju fans, aren't they? They're yeah. People that like that's their thing. Yeah. It's like kaiju mm-hmm. movies. Uh-huh. Yeah, I've listened to a few like podcasts <laughs> with them. And, yeah, like some yeah. people are just like, man, it's like this encyclopedic knowledge of all these movies. Whereas I've never been and that the, into it. I like Godzilla in the original, and I like Shin Godzilla. I, yeah. Once it just becomes like a giant ape fighting a giant lizard, I'd kind of check out. <laughs> Yeah, I've seen those like King Kong versus Godzilla. That's pretty bad. A great use of like, uh, I guess, face paints. So, like they, they paint their faces to be like the Native Americans or whatever. <laughs> it's really uh, insensitive, I guess. <laughs> Spoilers. But you could get some of that in King Kong Godzilla. Spoiler part: Godzilla dies at the end. What do they say in the next movie? Do they ever explain that? That's what I'm curious about the chronology. Is there a second Godzilla in the second movie? They just say he had Oh, yeah, because I did watch the one after. I think they just bring him back to life or something. Really? From a skeleton? Yeah. <laughs> they just bring him back. Okay. It's, it's it, about as basic as that. <laughs> Isn't there like a line at the end where they say like it could happen again? No, I've seen the movie. It's Godzilla Strikes Again. I just... Oh, Godzilla Raids Again. I'm sorry. I just honestly couldn't tell you because that one is like so forgettable it's like so okay. much worse than the first godzilla and he fights like some other fucking monster in it that no one cares about you know it's not like one of the good monsters it's not like mecha godzilla <laughs> <laughs> or mothra do they use the same theme uh, song as the movies keep going like dun 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 oh, fuck dun, yeah. dun, 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 they dun, use dun, that dun, theme dun, to dun, shit dun, dun. it's great the theme song. Yeah, dun, man. Dun, 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 I like dun, it. Dun, 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 dun. But some French asshole named Leo Carax, or however you pronounce it, keeps using it in his movies, and it's kind of ruined for me because his movies are really bad. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> Use the Godzilla theme. Yeah. Um, it's associated with like some of the most cringe moments in cinema history for me now, and it's that's very a shame. Sad. Yeah. <laughs> I've never seen those, so it hasn't been it hasn't been tainted for me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, th- these movies, I bet use them in a campy way as well. Not so much this movie. I thought this movie used it well. The, the first Godzilla, 1954. And this yeah. one isn't about Godzilla fighting monsters at all. I think that's like one of the most yeah. important things to note about it. It's about yeah. Yeah. Godzilla just fights human beings, basically. He just kills fights people yeah. and destroys... <laughs> yeah, he's just, yeah, he's versing the army or the military or the government. Um, and yeah, that's mainly what it's about. Uh, and it, it, it's a dark movie. It's not... Mm-hmm supposed to be fun the destruction like a family gets killed within like the first 20 minutes 15 minutes of the movie yeah and these shots of like a family like we're gonna see daddy soon or whatever (laughs) like as a mom Mm -hmm. is holding her children and they're about to die like this is it's like a dark film it's it's clearly really really scary in the 50s i would have thought oh yeah, yeah that's another thing i was thinking about it's catering to the whole paranoia of yeah the atom bomb um i don't even know paranoia um, it's it's an anti-war movie. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, because that's what's that, that's it's like baked into the story, isn't it? It's like the the post war yeah. yeah. bombing, like the mm-hmm, that's the whole point. Yeah, the st- that causes it all to happen. It it, uh-huh. it is a symbolic kind of film. They mention hydrogen bombs a bunch. There's like the woman on the train who's like, oh, I just escaped Nagasaki, and now this <laughs> like. You know, it's so very clearly <laughs> yeah. aware that this is supposed to, you know, Godzilla has radioactive powers, you know, it's it's all yeah, there. He comes from a, he comes from a nuclear test. Yeah, hydrogen like, bomb. That's how he was made. Yeah. Godzilla represents the atom bomb and he yeah. represents the destruction of like yeah, Hiroshima an and Nagasaki yeah, mm-hmm. during World War II. And he represents like the fear of something like that happening again, mm-hmm. <laughs> like that, that as well. Mm-hmm. You know, because he could always come back. There's like the whole plot line with like the scientist also, who's like, he's kind of having like an Oppenheimer kind of arc where he's with the oxygen destroyer. Yeah, the oxygen destroyer, which he's they're going to use to destroy Godzilla, but he doesn't want to use it 
and he doesn't want to give it to the government because you know once he lets it out like the cat's out of the bag it could be used as a weapon like for the rest of time and he thinks it's too yeah. dangerous you know it's definitely going for like the atom bomb like that mm. kind of thing yeah mm-hmm. you know it, it it's like every part of this movie yeah it's so intentional that's what it's yeah. about it comes from a very real place which is nice yeah when i'm watching a film like this with very dated effects for the most part so there are some parts that look really cool other parts that don't myself as a mm-hmm. viewer you know you're watching certain parts you're like okay that's a dude in a suit and some shots it works <laughs> really well and then it's like ah oh, they cut back and then his tail hit the water and it's like ah oh, that's the wrong speed or like the waves splashing and it's like <laughs> ah it ruins it a little or like there's some really great miniatures but then the helicopter as it's rolling over looks like shit like <laughs> it, it, I, I can't yeah. deny that it does, I'm not like fully sucked into the things that are happening and again this is another older film where it's more about like oh this is what it meant for people in the time periods sort of thing and it's more of like an educational experience rather than like an actual yeah. movie yeah, experience so for important. me yeah 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 so yeah I mean like there's plenty of examples of this kind of thing where I'm thinking like damn it to be a person in the 50s <laughs> watching this film in Japan just imagining like them in a theater it's so much easier to be sucked into something and and be able to take what you're seeing literally if you have no idea what's going into it practically or what the methodology is for like the special effects being used. Mm -hmm. A lot of what they're doing in that film is just now common knowledge for people. So we're never going to be able to have that same experience again. But yeah, the further back you go in time, like the less aware the average audience member would be of like the filmmaking process or other special effects. So, you know, it's nice to just think about what it must have been like for those people and just how epic (laughs) it would have been, you know? Yeah. (laughs) Kind of, yeah. It's a reflection of the film industry at the time in in Japan and what they were capable of, Mm -hmm. like the technology they were capable Mm -hmm. of. Yeah. Uh, Although, I, you know, there is a part of me also, like, if if, uh, this is what winds up happening every time I'm watching older films is I wind up comparing them to, like, other older films. And so an unavoidable comparison for Godzilla is obviously King Kong. And so that was like, what, 20 yeah. years earlier? Yeah, bring that up. yeah. King Kong is American, In the 30s, to, yeah. to be fair. Yeah. Yeah, different this industry. Is like, <laughs> this is Japan after World War II. Yeah. Like, you know? Yeah, very good point. Yeah, yeah. But even, even like, but ignore the special effects for a bit, but like, what's happening, like, narratively and tonally, I'm so much more behind King Kong than I am Godzilla. Godzilla is not a bad movie. For sure. Me, me as well. Godzilla, I think sorry, King, King Kong is just like such a fucking trip. Like I, I'll yeah, put that movie definitely. on as many times, you know. Like that—that's yeah, a great. I get right. Like you said, it's between. twenty years before, basically, and yeah, like the the stop motion on King Kong is great. Um, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. I like I like the effects in Godzilla. They're a reflection of what Japan was basically capable of at the time. Yeah, right? that's a good way to put it. And it also has a lot of like famous Japanese actors who were there. Uh, like a guy he's in a few Kurosawa movies, Takashi Shimura. Uh huh. That's his name. <laughs> I, oh, yeah. He's in Ikaru. He's in, you know, Seven Samurai, which came out the same year as Godzilla. You know, so there's clearly like <laughs> some overlap there. Like he's a mm. big actor. Like you said, it's most comparable to King Kong. It's and King Kong is a better movie. Just mm-hmm. the, the effects are a little more unique and memorable than like a guy in a rubber suit. <laughs> yeah, well, I saw, yeah, I sure. saw it referenced as Suitmation. Have you seen this before? Suitmation. Yeah. Can- Suit mation, as, in, as in, I guess, I guess, like animation, yeah. but with a suit. Power weird, Rangers. weird name. I, I can see why it didn't catch on. <laughs> suit nation. Soup nation. Yeah, the soup nation. You know what this movie did better than King <laughs> Kong, though, is sound design. That's what I really loved about this movie. That was probably my favorite mm. part about Godzilla, is the sound design. Except the music. <laughs> Except Godzilla's theme. Yeah, and not just the theme, but like <laughs> the um, like really low orchestral drums that are almost supposed to mimic like stomping foot sounds as part of like the, yeah, the soundtrack. Yeah, definitely. But Those are like the noise for stuff. Godzilla, like I don't know what they did. Did you ever look up like how they got that noise? Because they wound up reusing that even they still use that today or like derivative versions of that. It's like a really mm-hmm. effective, yeah, it's an amazing noise. unique sound to it. Yeah, Godzilla's roar is great. Yeah, throughout the film, there's like a lot of really great sound design. I think that that's the best part of it, in my opinion. Yeah. Do we know how Godzilla, how they recorded that? Should I look it up? I d- yeah, I did read it, but I couldn't quote it off the top of my head right now. It's something on the strings, like being s- like scraped across it. Yeah, his roar, yeah. Let's it's like, see you. yeah, it's something like that. It was actually a double bass 
using a leather glove yeah. coated in pine tar resin to create friction. <laughs> there you yeah. Go. Let's see. Yeah, this is talking about the uh, 1954 version. Wow, that's really cool. That's dope. That is really cool. Yeah, Damn, the sound creative. is great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And it, it says a lot they're still using it, like he nailed it in 54. Yeah, mm-hmm. well, I mean, like, they're not just reusing the same sound bite. Like, other people cre- in the new Godzilla movies are essentially having to recreate it, which is, like, another yeah, yeah. <laughs> challenge in of itself when it's already yeah. just, like, Mm-hmm. So iconic and memorable and unique and sure. Yeah, the American ones and some of the newer Godzilla films, they do the CGI. The effects on Godzilla are a bit more believable, you know. <laughs> like Godzilla looks much better in in King of the Monsters or whatever the newest ones. My you favorite know, look of and, Godzilla and like might scale. have been Shin Godzilla in terms of like yeah, yeah those yeah. were really inspired one because they use like a He's practical so suit also. Yeah, it looked really yeah, fucked was, up. It looks good. Was that factor. was something sure. really yeah, yeah. weird. The eyes and the... Yeah. yeah. It was it's like burned it to my memory, you know? In all of the new I've ones, I think once. he looks good. Yeah. yeah At yeah. this point, audiences expect like a better like effect. So like Godzilla's usually the scale now. Like it looks great. <laughs> yeah, like I, I think back to like Son of Godzilla. Like it looks terrible. <laughs> it looks so fucking mm-hmm. bad. Like by, to- by today's standards, no one would watch that. Never seen it. Yeah, good. <laughs> you don't need to. Cool. I mean, I guess you could if you want. Like maybe a good movie to watch with the dads <laughs> on Father's Day, <laughs> Son of Godzilla. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's funny. Well, what else is there to say about this movie? Um, this is a obviously a huge movie in America, which is you know interesting because it's a Japanese film. But these these took off in America because I guess people like the concept. They like uh, monsters fighting and they like monsters. Uh, destroying buildings and whatever the fuck stomping around but in a big it's crazy because i mean just consider what this movie's about and like you know after world war ii and after like america leaves the occupation of japan or whatever and like just like 10 years 20 years before like japan had an emperor like they had this the, mm. like they believed like there was like a divine being like ruling like over them like it's crazy and now just like now like this the japanese film industry is like come so far and they're releasing like this anti-war movie about like the atom bomb in america and like america fucking eats it up like we fucking love it (laughs) even though that's like overtly what the movie's about it's like a very anti-war movie it's about the suffering like you know hiroshima and nagasaki and that shit yeah and it's crazy how it took off here you know i think that's a really strong part of this movie it showed like American audiences like the other side of the coin, <laughs> and it showed them just like how far the the Japanese military had come since World War II, and like the government and all of those aspects mm-hmm. of their society like since World War II, like showing it in a film and then showing that film in America, like that was huge. All of that was huge. Mm-hmm. There's some really I, I really enjoyed the uh, the typhoon scene near the beginning. I thought they were. There was some like really raw emotion in the performances there. Great lighting. Sure. And obviously great sound design again. Mm-hmm. There are other parts of the movie I was not huge on the acting. Emiko was not good. <laughs> her uh, <laughs> her reaction mm. to the fish tank thing was like kind of cringe. <laughs> yeah. Just throwing that out there. But it had some good female characters in there. It had some like strong women characters. I thought that was a good part of the film. I don't know if on a personal level, I could call any of them strong characters. I related to them about as much <laughs> as I did as like characters from Dune, in the sense that I wasn't sure. really watching for <laughs> them. You know, I think that's intentional. I think it's a, I yeah. think it's intentionally a very like cold and distant film. I think the best Godzilla movies that come after this like try to mimic this tone really, like the mm-hmm. the most recent one, the 2017 one, or Shin Godzilla. They're like very. Uh, yeah, they're like contagion also. They're like that kind of tone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I need the commentary in there. Once once you remove the you know, the obvious commentary in it is becomes more about the fighting. It's yeah. It can be a bit much. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think the black and white helps too with like the realism uh, making the images a bit more believable. <laughs> Like I'm a little more invested in it because of that, the black and white, which is not something that the some of the sequels have. I, I don't really resonate with this movie particularly, um, but I've always had a soft spot for it. I used to watch this 
when I was quite young. Um, I, like my nan got like a copy of it with some newspaper or something and just gave it to me. And I remember like being confused by the the first like 10 minutes is like just text, not knowing about like their credits and why they're put there. And so I got fond <laughs> memories of it, but yeah, I, I, I appreciate it, I guess, more than come on, it's time to sit down and watch the original Godzilla again. I do find it more educational and illuminating in terms of yeah yeah it's it's made in 1954 it's got the suit mation the the first movie was suit mation and everything i like that and the, the, i was surprised by how good the uh that there's kind of an argument scene a, a dinner table argument where i found the conflict to be like oh this is actually like a yeah the core conflict is really strong and and, the, and the, what people are arguing about here is like yeah this is surprisingly grounded for how silly the big lizard man in a suit is and yeah 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 i, I just connect with that side of it mm -hmm. yeah they show the bureaucracy like everyone trying to deal with like this monster <laughs> like how do we deal with this thing how does the military deal with it <laughs> it's very practical like i like those scenes mm -hmm. they're going through like all the people who died right like in some kind of senate hearing and they're like well how many livestock did you lose oh yeah we lost five sheep <laughs> three cows <laughs> i think that was intentional <laughs> I think yeah. some like yeah i think for sure that's intentional mm -hmm. yeah i i agree it's uh something that i have a lot of respect for it is more of like an educational experience for me than it is an entertainment one there's some parts that i'm really into it as i've said you know some sequences some moments but overall i would say like story-wise it's really basic i, I mean it, again without the subtext as like an actual narrative yeah, not it's educational, to but, the but then you see Godzilla destroy buildings. But I, I <laughs> don't. I see a guy in a suit walk around. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying. You know? Yeah. <laughs> like, saying, I, like, I don't see Godzilla destroy buildings. I see a dude in a suit. <laughs> but, yeah, it's better when it's more obscure but, towards the in beginning. In the context yeah. like, I like of the, the movie. The footprints yeah. Yeah, yeah, by yeah. the sea and everything, and the build-up is all good. Uh-huh. But that's the hook. Like, when you're a kid, that's the stuff I, at least oh, I yeah, love. Sure. And then when you see it again and you look into it, you're like, yeah, all this history, all this context of, mm -hmm. like, I see why Godzilla is the icon he is. Why Toho marketed this character. Because it's, you know, it's important and it's cool. And it's, like, everything you want, like, to market in a, in a film series. Like, mm -hmm. it's great. We got a film series centered around, like, this monster. <laughs> like this, you know, there's mm -hmm. like 30 movies about this fucking like guy in a rubber suit. <laughs> it's not like his <laughs> character that's like got any, you know, distinct kind of personality or played by some kind of actor. It's not like James Bond, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, I yeah, like the look symbol. of Godzilla in this movie too. He always looks different. I really like the look of him in this movie. He looks kind of deformed and freaky. Like, yeah, a there, yeah, there is something David scary character. about it. <laughs> yeah. There is one shot where it looks a bit goofy, but. Same thing happened in King Kong, so whatever. I feel like he looks goofy here. In some of the sequels, he looks goofy. Oh, yeah? I mean, it's hard to suspend your disbelief. Like, I never believed, like, there was actually, like, a monster on screen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a guy mm -hmm. in a suit, but I don't know. Something about Depends that on tone. The for me. Yeah. Something about that tone and, and that presentation of the movie. It gives it a certain quality. Yeah. Where I'm like, yeah, this, this is a movie that stands out. Mm -hmm. I, I see why people love it almost... Yeah, why it's revered like King Kong is and why they met up yeah. and how to fight. <laughs> it's an important It is the movie. Japanese King Kong. Yeah. King Kong's like the American monster. Yeah. Yeah. It's a shame I can't get behind the sequels. Yeah. But I, I just, yeah. That's when it gets too goofy for me. Yeah, mm. th like we said, this movie, it has history. It has context. It's like educational. <laughs> it's dark. It, it, like the, the the destruction scenes are fantastic. Like I think they're really great in this movie, and yeah, they're so long. Like they really yeah, focus really on sets. them. Yeah, for sure. This is a good one. <laughs> this is a good movie. I'd recommend it. What would you guys? Do you want to get into ratings? I don't know if yes. you have anything else to say. Yeah. <laughs> so let's get into ratings. You guys go first. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of torn on what to rate it to be honest. Because yeah, yeah, I do appreciate it more than just sit down and watch it. So. I, I think this is a uh, like a three and a half star for me. I think Shin Godzilla is kind of like the modernized take on this, um, which mm -hmm. I'd recommend watching. Like both. That's mm -hmm. one of the those. better ones. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I got my issues with that film too, <laughs> but if I'm, <laughs> yeah, if I'm gonna, yes. by the no means perfect. The monster scenes are a bit more impactful, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. By no means is it perfect, but uh, as far as continuing on that sort of 
the idea, the heart of the original movie. I, I, I appreciate yeah. that side of the storytelling as opposed to, you know, and, the and as far type. as this one being released right after World War II and after all that shit, like, like I yeah, said, the context like that was cool. And, yeah. And it, it, and it took off in America, like Japan made this and then they released it in America. Mm -hmm. Like that, that other version sucks, but this one's great. And this is the one that ultimately stood the test of time. Not True. that really bad one. Yeah. Criterion didn't release that one. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. I thought they, they released, released a big one. package. I thought it was supposed to have like all of them. I mean, they might have released it as them? like a bonus feature. I thought they had a whole box set of Godzilla. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I don't believe they movie. released this one. I thought it said the Toho collection or something, maybe. There must be. There are so many kaiju fans out there. Yeah, the Showa era but is it's a box set. the same set. movie. The Showa era films, 1954 to 1975, is the Criterion box set. So I wonder what's in it. Mm -hmm. I don't think they have the 1956 one. You never know. You should buy it. Yeah, <laughs> a movie that I uh, appreciate having seen. Good for cinema history. Kind of basic for my entertainment value. Giving it a 6 out of 10. Yeah, it's a uh, it's hmm. basic, but it's a great allegory. <laughs> it's a, like it's, I I love it. I think it's uh it's closer to a nine, but I think I'd give it like an eight out of ten if cool. I had to rate it. Yeah, nice. it's a good one. It's a great horror movie, mm -hmm. unlike Soho. Yeah, mm. Godzilla. It's a fun <laughs> yeah, Godzilla is both a fun character and a very menacing character. <laughs> He's yeah. a big boy. All right, question time. Okay, let's do some questions from the Sardoncast community. Head over to the subreddit where there'll be a suggestion thread where you can ask us whatever you like. Jvas685 asks one that a small part of my brain is, is telling me we've asked before, but I, I can't remember what the answers were if we did. So what are the worst documentaries that you've ever seen? You can choose based on very flawed information, awful presentation, or both. Worst documentaries? Yeah, I've seen one on... Yeah, I've seen some bad ones. Yeah, what's a documentary, that, like a bad one that stands out in your mind? Room 237, You Can't Kill Meme. <laughs> that's Wait, a terrible You title. Can't Kill Meme? That's that's curious to me. That's why I watched it. It was... Uh, just, what, just watch my Fantasia Festival video because I, I don't want to get it. I, oh, it doesn't deserve to be one, explained okay. right now. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. Oh yeah, I just I just searched uh, up <laughs> mimetic magic. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> it's not good. Um, oh. Yeah, let's. Uh, those those are the two that Have jump seen, out uh, in my mind the strongest. But uh, what the health stands out to me? Have you seen that one? That sounds so familiar. I think it was like a Netflix documentary about. Um, uh, veganism and, and all this. Yeah, it's just see. super disingenuous. Yeah, I didn't watch it. It's on my watch list, though. Yeah, it's not. That's From not the creators the of Cowspiracy. It scared the emojis out of me. Cowspiracy? Yeah. It scared yeah, the emojis out of me. Oh, and he produced It's an interesting question because, like, I do. <laughs> you kind of have to go out of your way to, like, I don't know, unless you're watching tons and tons of documentaries. But I feel like I when I'm going out my way to go for a documentary is what I know is on a subject that's interesting or explored well or it's been recommended. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, Documentaries don't know. are like hard. pretty hard to fuck up if you're just like <laughs> yeah, trying to be honest about what you're presenting and you're not like completely incompetent. Yeah. Cause if you look up like lists of like the worst documentaries, it is just, it's just dishonesty and bad faith or badly yeah. mis or presented information. Let's just look up ghost documentaries or Bigfoot documentaries. <laughs> you probably find bad ones. Or like few, alien um, alien documentaries like those. Like UFO sighting documentaries. Have hmm. you seen that Vaxxed documentary from 2016? That sounds funny. From it's Cover Up to Catastrophe? One. Yeah. I haven't. I'll add it to my watch list. <laughs> <laughs> sounds great. Yeah. Some good stuff. Oh, I did see What the Bleep Do We Know when I was younger. That one's pretty bad. It's like a, one of those like uh, spiritual nonsense movies where they're like, yo, if you just like think something, it's true. There's another one called The Secret oh. that says that. It's based <laughs> off of a book too, and it's like a bestseller. But it, yeah, essentially, essentially they're like, um, if you just like, 
if you think something really hard enough, it'll happen. So the starving kids in Africa, they're just not thinking hard enough about what they want. <laughs> they don't address it in but, that way. I'm just saying one of the obvious <laughs> flaws about yeah, yeah, yeah. what they're saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just replace it with prayer. You got a different movie. Okay. Let's do this one from Cole Shilo Britt. If you had the opportunity to write a script for a popular horror franchise, which one would you choose and why? Popular horror franchise. Come on, Adam, you got it. Why would you want to do that? <laughs> like, I could, like, I don't know, some Nightmare on Elm Street stuff could be fun. Fucking Saw. You know what? Saw. Done. Saw. Yeah, yeah, Easily. Saw. <laughs> I would have said Saw, but I, I figured that would be your one. Yeah. Yeah. Da, da, da. Yeah, I could save that franchise right now. Fucking hit me up, Lionsgate. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> yeah. Give people what they want. Yeah, start the uh, change.org petition. Yeah. You get people to sign it, get Sardonicos fans signed in it. Um, I would say. I don't know. I think the the gimmick of Final Destination is like there's some comedy potential that <laughs> you could do some like funny stuff with that. That mm-hmm, sort of yeah. um, like funny horror. Um, yeah, because I can't remember like it's, I haven't really seen the Final Destination movie since I was a teenager. Mm-hmm. Why, why did that peter out? Why did was there like a particularly bad one it ended on or something? Or? They're all I mean bad, but... they were getting pretty <laughs> the bad by good. the end of it. Yeah, yeah. they all made money i think i'm just wondering why they stopped making them they got lazy they're still making saw movies i don't think they were as profitable as like as like some of the cheaper ones like paranormal activity so they mm. stopped for that reason yeah. yeah yeah i don't know make a sequel i could make an it follows sequel <laughs> do it an it follows sequel yeah go for it yeah mercer sama has this one how often do you guys go to the cinema alone do you think it's better watching movies by yourself or with friends I usually bring a friend. I value both. But yeah, I don't need to. If it's a mo- if a friend's yeah, busy, I'm not going to be like, oh, I'm not going to see it. I'm just going to watch the movie. Yeah. 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 Sometimes I go by myself. It's fun. They're both fun. Yeah, it's not like my both. friends yeah. talking during the movie. It's usually like some fucking asshole in the theater. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, true. Easy. What about this one uh, from GGG375. Do you think there will ever be an end to the endless barrage of reboots, remakes, and sequels? I feel like every studio no. movie is an existing intellectual property. This year we have a new Halloween, Matrix, Space Jam, Sopranos prequel, etc. Are studio films and IP synonymous? Will studios ever strive to be more original? I feel like the existing state of movies is so depressing since the only time new, interesting movies seen seem to get produced are for streaming, and indie films get such small distribution and never get talked about like big studio films are even though they're usually better thoughts. Uh, mm-hmm. There's two exceptions. There's animation, so kids' movies, and then there's like A24 films, which are not as big blockbusters as, you know, obviously like Marvel or anything, but they they are representing somewhat of a shift in terms of what audience members are willing to pay for. And it is, I guess, partially how they market them, which is a bit dishonestly, and they pretend as if it's something that people have seen before when it's not. Um, so yeah, the answer to that question is, it will happen if we reward studios in that way. If we tell people this is what we want by buying tickets to mm. original properties and not buying tickets to remo- reboots and remakes, then it'll happen. They'll follow where the money is. It's up to us, really. So Yeah. But, yeah, we've already kind of set the die with the kind of movies we like and go to see. Although the response to Eternals has been quite um, uplifting to me in terms of this. <laughs> <I'm>, I'm <laughs> so, I, I thought they were, like, untouchable, like... But here we are. They're, I don't know. They might still make money. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. They'll yeah, make true. money. Yeah, still, I don't know about the money. So. I think people are kind of jaded. They're kind of worn out yeah, with the Marvel that's the, what shit. I mean, like, uh, culturally, like, is it uh-huh. the crap How much Marvel now? can you take? How many fucking yeah. movies? Well, so I'm just thinking about, like, when I was in the cinema today, like, what played before last night in Soho, and it's like a Resident Evil movie. There's, like, a new Resident Evil movie coming out. There's, like, yeah. fucking Looks Eternals. Like shit. There's, fucking a new Scream. <laughs> it's like... Yeah. Yeah, it, 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 the Hollywood, like, stuff, like, the... I guess because they, they just inherently require such big investments to get made, and they have these, like, fucking ridiculous budgets. Uh, everyone's just shitting themselves in terms of, like, the risk-reward factor. Like, <laughs> the only risk, like, they're willing to invest in is like Christopher Nolan or proven entities. Yeah, barely yeah, even feel no after 49 was yeah, considered barely. not like a financial success. Yeah, they had like, no faith in him. Yeah, they had no we're not faith even going to green light your second part of your movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, they I mean, fucked up with that. Yeah. Really? 
Wow. It's risky. It's like you said. You you need a safe investment. Just do the same shit like you did before. Mm-hmm. And that's all you're going to do. But like I think you said before, Alex, like there's only, you can only do that for so long. Like you're going to run out of things yeah. to remake before you're just remaking remakes. Of like yeah, we'll thing. just be perpetually stuck in the 80s. <laughs> we'll never progress. Yeah, like we're stuck in we're the in 80s now. Loop. Like we're still, we're still making it and Halloween and <laughs> like all this shit that we need to leave it behind and do something new. Yeah. You know, that's why I like Dune or like the French Dispatch. At least it's something different. At least it is a marvel again and yeah like i hate seeing that eternals trailer it's before every fucking movie it's the same joke <laughs> it's that ikea joke just fucking over and over like yeah, enough three hour long fucking <laughs> it's like they didn't even make a new trailer oh, oh dear cool okay let's do this one from uh, taco master zero one two greetings boys how often do you clean your screens tv monitor and what do you use duster wipes <laughs> spray of any sort do you guys clean your TV? Uh, you if I this? notice yeah. dust and I notice things on it, then I'll clean it. If I don't notice anything, then I won't. I hate dust. I hate dust. I hate when it builds. <laughs> it gets <laughs> everywhere. I've actually got this really good like, cleaner. <laughs> this it's like spray same. stuff. Is it just compressed uh, air or is sense. it like a... What's it <laughs> no, no, it's actual... Uh, I'm holding it on my hand right now. It's, it's called, called Screen Mom. M-O-M. Mom. Screen mom. Mother. Yeah, which is oh. weird for it being like in the UK because we okay. don't spell mom that way. But um, yeah, it's like a natural screen cleaner. It does a Very sick cool. job if you wipe them with the cool. microfiber cloth. Makes it look brand mm-hmm. new. Yeah, I have one. Of, I have a bunch of those microfiber It's not sponsored cloths. by the way. <laughs> yeah. If you get a sponsor, then the sponsor. Yeah, they come with screen mom. <laughs> Give us your cash. Yeah, I clean them pretty often. I use like the microfiber. Sometimes, like spray Windex on a cloth and like use that. I think that works fine on a right. TV. Yeah, yeah, and that's it. I have like the can of pressurized air, but I don't really use that for screens. But you can. Yeah. Would you spray that on a TV? The air? Yeah. No, probably not. Yeah. I, I use that for like my keyboard. Yeah, I use it for like my PC fans. Yeah. Mm. But I guess you could if there's like dust on your screen. I hate dust. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. All right, I guess All that right, about guess does it, it for yeah. questions. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Thanks for your questions. Yeah, thanks. Both. So we uh, the movie for next time. There's two polls, and I have the results oh, of yeah. one poll in front of me right now. Ralph, I'm going to need you to log into the Patreon to see the results of the other poll. Yeah, sure. Okay. I'll wait for you to yeah, do that. And we then... did a poll. So we're going to watch two different movies. And we're doing it based on the results as of Here goes. right now. <laughs> the results are in. Da, da, da. The number one movie on Patreon. Twenty two percent of the vote is possession, nineteen eighty one. Woo! All right. Cool. We'll be watching that. Nice. And then on the straw poll, second film we will also be watching for next episode. SpongeBob the movie. Two thousand four. <laughs> it's nice. happening. It's at the top with yes. six hundred thirty four votes. 12%. For yeah, the Patreon it, it poll, changed. that was the runner-up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It would have been the Cornetto the trilogy poll. otherwise, but I'm actually relieved. Yeah. I might have actually vetoed it if it was the Cornetto trilogy, because I don't want to watch four fucking movies for them, you know. Like, and we're going to yeah, recommend that at some just, point we anyway. About Soho. That seems like a yeah, waste we'll of a, a recommendation. So I'm glad yeah. SpongeBob pulled yeah, true. <laughs> I'll probably recommend Eternal Sunshine at some point anyway. That was third place here. Yeah, let me see here. Um, we yeah, should do yeah. this again. Um, but like the sure. second runner-up was SpongeBob movie and Cornetto trilogy. Yeah, they both had seventeen percent exactly. <laughs> That's funny. It's crazy. <laughs> and then yeah, Eternal Sunshine had five percent. So that was like the runner-up. Um, Vengeance trilogy. What the fuck is that? That's uh, Old Boy, Lady Vengeance, Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance, oh. the Chanwick Park. Mm. Okay. I would like okay. to see Three Colors trilogy at some That'd point. Be good. So yeah, I mean, like all the stuff on here, stuff I want to see anyway, or would wouldn't mind talking about. Yeah, there were lots of good trilogy recommendations. I was convinced that To Boldly Flee would win, but that didn't happen. So. <laughs> I, I think I'm the only one of us that hasn't Let seen it. Let me see. Yeah. I have never made it yeah. through the whole thing. I had okay. 2% of the so vote. that would be torture yeah. for another time. J- just watch my video on it. <laughs> I yeah. mean, really. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Don't fucking torture much. yourself for that shit. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. All right. And uh, so next episode, instead of releasing it normal for the 100th, and we'll see, if, I don't know if this will happen more than one time, uh, we're going to be doing a live stream on Monday the... 
twenty uh, second of November, we will be streaming live to the Sardonicast YouTube channel. More details to come. We might do it in a way where we answer super chat questions, or we might prioritize with some questions from our patrons. Maybe we'll, uh, I don't know, we'll f- we'll figure it out. We'll we'll post some stuff on the Reddit and some tweets and whatnot about exactly what we're doing. But the plan is to do a live, unedited, 100th episode stream of Sardonicast on Monday, November nice. 22nd. And it will probably be, I don't know, let's assume maybe a noon Pacific time or something like that. I don't know yet. Follow the Twitter, follow the subreddit, follow the Facebook. And if you want to know what time we're going to be doing it, then we'll keep you posted there. We just haven't decided yet. There's some other factors going into what time it will be. But that's the plan. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Episode 100. Very exciting. 100. Yeah, cool. Yeah, Man. boy. All right. Oh, yeah. Three digits. <laughs> that's We've made it <laughs> okay. to the third digit. Yeah, that's crazy. It's Finally. for hardcore people. You're going to be in three digits for a while. Oh, my God. Yeah, wait. So thousand. what's the math here? How many years have we been doing this? I think we'll be dead before four digits. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably <will>. straight up. <laughs> <If we're doing laughs> We'd have to weeks. record much more. Yeah, we have yeah, to do one much sooner. more often. <laughs> we could just, why don't we just skip some numbers? <laughs> yeah, that's the job. That's funny. <laughs> Fuck the 500s. All right. All right, thanks for listening, everybody. <laughs> that's our poll. Yeah, thanks right, for participating. Bye-bye. bye-bye.